Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Metaverse Nomads podcast, uh, live stream, uh, whatever we're calling it these days. This is episode number 36, which means we've been doing this for a while now. And it's usually some of the same suspects joining us live. We appreciate you being here with us. And we've got some of the usual suspects as the Metaverse Nomads who are here showing up today. Uh, one who hasn't been with us for a little bit, and that is uh, Bonafide. He's back here with us. How are you doing, brother? I'm doing good, man. Good to be back. Good morning, everybody out there. We're all going to make it. We are going to make it. Ray, how you doing? I'm doing good. Busy. Uh, but, you know, got to gotta make do of what we have. Nice. How about you, Fancy? What's happening, man? Doing great. Yeah, I like the theme we have going, uh, Superman and Flash. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> hey, superheroes in the metaverse showing up today. That's what's going on. Can never go too fast in the metaverse. That's right. And I'm Jesse, also known as Whitticus, and it's good to be here with you again while we talk about all things related to the metaverse. And it's interesting, you know, the projects are growing, growing through their growing pains. And uh, it seems like while there's kind of a lull in some of the development cycles of many of the projects we're taking a look at these days, um, who's taking front and center in the news happens to be some of the uh, some of the the gangs of the the cryptoverse, you know, um, doing their dastard, dastardly deeds while the uh, the projects learn how to plug the holes. And again, this is the wild west of the metaverse uh, that we're in at the moment. But uh, let's jump into some news. Where we want to start, guys? Yeah, uh, so the Star Treasury was uh, drained, and that was uh, straight that sent straight to the Tornado Cash, and uh, yeah, people were quite devastated about it. It's a lot of money, four million in ETH. It's yep. a tricky thing. I mean, it's like right now. You, let's say that you start off as you got an idea. And you've got some capable friends or someone that you want to partner with. And you put all the blood, sweat, and tears, and you bring this project to life. And then you got to recruit folks who are going to support your project and believe in it by their, in, their investment into what it is that you're creating as you continue that cycle of creation. And then all the while, some hacker shows up and says, hey, we're going to disrupt all that you're doing. Yeah, it's a lot to be disappointed about, but um, that's kind of the nature of the the early days of the wild west yeah safety yeah. is always a top priority and it, and it just seems to be the case where there's an ongoing war against uh security and how good it is versus the people trying to exploit whatever they can to just extract as much as they can because you know flipping nfts it takes a lot of time it's a tedious thing and you have to wait <laughs> so if you could just learn how to hack just might as well learn how to do that within a year and then Get, go at it with any of these protocols who are just up and coming and I have a couple of hundred or thousands of ETH in them. It just <laughs> has think to do with that. the speed of the innovation, right? Yeah. Because we're innovating so fast that all the, the Legos aren't getting into place. And so if one of those happens to be a security measure, then, yeah, you, you know, these, these things are growing so fast that you might have four million, you know, in a in a in a wallet somewhere that's going to get hacked you know i mean that's just kind of comes with the territory of being right there on the cutting edge right can you imagine like if you had this gang of of uh, crypto villains and it's like you they're you know as they join your gangs like all right where are you going to focus you're going to focus on the discord scams or are you are you going to make the mock nfts what what do you got going on oh you're, you you're one of the hackers that's going to hack these you know hack a bridge and uh, so you got to get become familiar with tornado you know maybe that's his nickname you're the villain tornado <laughs> <laughs> at this point you could just build a company of just hacking <laughs> different um, departments, I'm, different games. I'm sure they have a uh, little conglomerates out there, right? Right. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, just quite a simple public execute function, which they shouldn't have been able to access, uh, as these things generally are. Uh, code is law, and uh, there are loopholes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, moving on. Uh, the hacker last week of uh, on the Ronin network, he started to move the Ethereum to uh, Tornado Cash as well. Yeah, there's a Ethereum. lot of eyes. Yeah, that's a lot of Ethereum. A lot of eyes are on the address and where the Ethereum is and what's being done with it. And yeah, it's Tornado is starting to have some of it and it's getting put on the Avalanche chain. And that's confusing a lot of people because it's just like, what are you going to do over there? 
it, it's it's almost like you're not going to be able to do much with it. Uh, and if you do, then it's going to be traced. But again, you know, at, at this point, who knows? It, it might be all gone, and it's not ever going to come back. Uh, but there was some some type of good news coming out of all of this, where 150 million uh, was raised by Binance. So uh, we can get into that so, later. So I mean, okay. So you're you're CZ of Binance. What's your motivation in doing that? Were they one of? I mean, I you've, I think you mentioned before they were in there. They are an investor in Axie. Yeah. But what is their particular reason for stepping up? Is it solely to protect their investment? Is it to continue to support the cause? Like, what is their real reason for for ponying up that kind of money? Well, I'm going to take it from the standpoint of investment first. But overall, it helps to have the image of uh, and the reputation be one of a comeback and a, and a hero's journey type of situation because they have trailblazed more of the, or the whole space as far as gaming with the two token model. I know some projects are... Uh, more innovative in different ways or copying it and building on top of what Axie started with because there's flaws in almost every project at one point or another as time goes on. But yeah, from Binance's point of view, I'm sure that it's to keep the morale high in the NFT gaming space across different games and the market as a whole because uh, if, if you know a rising tide lifts all boasts. So if Axie Infinity was the the hull of the ship if we're gonna you know have this type of uh, framing and words of, of it then um then yeah all these smaller projects would benefit if uh in a, in in an indirect or maybe sometimes a direct way depending on where people's monies are invested uh so it, it's almost all intertwined and i could see it just benefiting the whole whether people like the game the art you know it, it, it it's kind of falls to the wayside. I know it's important to have daily active users to have the art somewhat attractive to keep people. But when it comes to just the reputation and how large Axie is and what they've done, I think it's it's in everyone's interest <laughs> to more or less, unless you completely have yeah. no affiliation with Metaverse anything. Just so, a cosign. Well, I was just going to say, just a cosign on uh, what, what he's saying, what Ray's saying there, though, is, I mean, CZ... I've been following this guy for years now at this point, and he has always been, I mean, he's not, he's not nearly as bad as like a Justin son or anything like that, but he's, he's always been there to uh, position himself in a way that shines a good light on Binance and a good light on him. He's had some, some stuff in the past, but I, I, don't, I don't see him missing an opportunity to, to get some good publicity. But didn't they knock off Axie? Isn't that what, like, was it star sharks or something like that? What, what, Remember, there was a it's it was an Axie knockoff that was on Binance Smart Chain, I believe. I'm not uh, sure if, if they created the game. I'm not. I'm, I don't affiliate with BSC Chain at all um, yeah. because of just what Bonafide was saying. Like, I'm not the most um, supportive of the chain and and yeah. CZ as a whole. But they're gonna do what they have to do to keep their business uh, running. <laughs> so sure. you can't complain there. And then on top of that, it's just that there was so many knockoffs. Because the model, yeah. and at the time, it was a success. So why I mean, at not? one point, like everybody was knocking off Axie. Is I think what you're trying to say, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, yeah. there's a million of them. And I, I, I know of one game on Binance, which is uh, the Thetan Arena, and it's nothing like Axie. It's actually really fun. Um, I don't know about it as far as you know. I haven't brought it, you know, to you guys because it's not great so far as you know putting your money in and making a whole bunch mm -hmm. of money playing or anything like that but it's a super fun game it's kind of yeah. like a little moment yeah so, Shane arena kind of fell off the the um, popularity charts because the economy kind of went to shit as well <laughs> with their yeah, the, the, the earning part of the play to earn wasn't really solid yeah. but the, yeah the game was super fun yeah if you I've got an early well so All that's right. an interesting point there so we have these two things that you know developers are trying to juggle uh, right now, because most of the market is crypto savvy and it almost makes it so that the, the markets are gamers as a secondary kind of thing. And so if the economy falls apart, even if the game is incredibly fun to play, it seems like interest kind of wanes away because of, of, of who the actual target market currently is. Now, that would probably change a bit if it was something that had a little bit more of the game world onboarded as we're like, oh, the game's still fun to play. I was here for the game and not so much the economy. But I think right now 
yeah, if the economy is not functioning properly, it, it can take a game down regardless of how fun the game is. That's the yeah. times that we're in right now. Um, before we jump off, I want to uh, go back to that comment from Shopping Channel. Could a hacker come along like Robin Hood, hack Axie for half a billion and give it to the investors who are still waiting for an ROI? That's a cold comment. <laughs> it, it, it is, but it's also interesting because we know that a, it's not difficult to round up uh, whoever has an NFT, like how many junk NFTs have you guys gotten? So people can find wallets. So it would be interesting to see at some point, somebody is going to do that. They're going to hack a project. They're not going to try and claim anything, but they're going to disperse funds right. to hold bunch of people's wallets. And then what do you do? The company's not, what, you got, everybody, can you please send that money back? <laughs> it ain't going to happen. Let's yeah. speak it into existence, everybody out there. Oh, you know, man. <laughs> <laughs> You just have a, a it raining on us all on our on our wallet. <laughs> Make it rain on my wallet. I just but but yeah to to um to the point that we were talking about earlier or the convo that we was just before we did the shopping channel. It's like that's why I think you can't discount any one project in particular as them as them not being able to adapt, change, or be successful because the initial daily active users more or less are more people or people with investment reasons for why they're here not so much a gamer so you have yeah. both who are gamers like i would say all of us are you know we're gamers but we also have that financial side which is now the investment savviness and it's it's just a matter of time before we have those investors or those people who just care about money weeded out almost just because the the earnings or the potential to earn is going to become lower uh, and the amount of work you're going to have to put in to make more is going to increase. So depending on what someone's willing to, to do to make enough money in the space, because it's not it's going to go anywhere. Some projects will you know, not stand the test of time. But the, for the big ones like Axie, this is uh, to maybe in our, in our minds a, a grand ex exploit, which it is for record purposes. But in the grand scheme of the next how many years that they'll be around, are they not going to innovate? Are they not going to do anything uh, on board more games onto Ronin? You know, where I just don't see it as something where in the long term, it's going to ruin the game. You know, it ruins the taste in people's mouths. And but we're, we're, see, we, can, we, we talk about gaming and investing kind of like if it's one and we have to make sure that we're making a distinct conversation or dialogue. Uh, or you know we have to separate those two at times because there's a lot of games like Day Arena that are fun but it's not where you should go if you want to make money and play to earn <laughs> you know unless you just grind it out or, or we're in early uh and had just like in every other game position yourself financially early on and then <clears throat> so continue that let me ask you this how responsible is axie for not having safeguards in place why didn't they have something that says hey you know what five percent of our entire you know pool has been liquidated alarms go off like shouldn't they be held accountable for some of that absolutely they, they take full responsibility from what they're saying they were on cm cmbc and i mean the player know, base wasn't hurt were they by the hack no not no one's private funds on their right. actual so it was the bridge that was hacked not the right. actual decentralized exchange so, so actually, or anyone's particular wallets it was just the <laughs> reserves in the bank where you would have to go to then transfer or swap um, onto the EVM chain from Ronin. Uh, I mean, not swap because the Dex Katana is the name of the Dex that lives on Ronin. And then you yeah. needed to get on the EVM chain where, via the bridge. And that's where all the Ethereum was, which was stolen. So stole essentially, right? right yeah. There's no liquidity. So essentially what you have on Ronin, which is safe, isn't worth anything a lot of people are saying because it's not backed by something valuable which was ethereum so is there any is there any inherent value in any of these coins maybe maybe not just axs what about eth right what's backing ethereum if something was to go wrong but this is my point where ethereum is so large it, they developed and have so many developers on it it's not just going to all developers on Ethereum are not just going to jump ship to go to Solana, right? right? Solana is in need and all these other layer one solutions, right, that are out there. We can get into that whole conversation, like how many of these layer ones are going to last if, if once this upgrade with Ethereum comes around and it makes some of these other layer ones obsolete. That's why they, I feel like there's a mad dash to build all of these games, all of these protocols, all of these things yeah. to do, which keeps people's money in there and, uh, and it attracts the developers keeps to engaging. stay. Right. Yep. So. Yeah, I think uh, I think you made a good point a little bit ago there, Ray. Um, 
you know, speaking of Binance, once again, I mean, they've been hacked. I don't know how many times, I think more than a handful. Yeah. And it was all in the way they handled it. And, and, you know, the, the story behind it and the way they, they moved forward past it. And they're still here to stay still, you know, one of the biggest exchanges out there, you know, still have a fairly good name for themselves um, across the industry. I mean, I don't I don't trust Binance, but I don't trust any of these uh, large exchanges either. So it's not like they're particularly evil compared to like a Coinbase or whatever right. else, you know. Right. Yeah. Self-interest, they're always going to be right there, whether it's talked about or not, as why they do certain things. I'm talking about these exchanges or Axie Infinity. A lot of people mm -hmm. want explanations to the T of what happened because we're community governance. This is what we were promised. Right. That's why we bought the token. But you got to be kind of realistic, even in the real world with with uh, 401ks. It's all promised to you. You can't. And, the, and then if if you want it, you get penalized. So it's not technically yours. Right. Uh, up until it's in your wallet address uh, or that you've swapped it for something that might, in your opinion, have more value because a lot of stuff is just valueless. <laughs> So, so as someone that doesn't know a whole lot about the inner workings of how this went down or how I, I, I don't know if I was Axie, I don't know how I would protect myself. I don't know if I was the thief, how I'd go about stealing it. I don't know any of this stuff. But when I look at it, the questions that I ask with someone with limited knowledge is a, why did it happen? B, were there things that they could have done to have prevented it? and see what did they learn from it so that it doesn't happen again. That's kind of what yeah. I personally want to know. Yeah, mm -hmm. all of this was covered last week. And then also, if if anyone's keeping up with the Twitter and what's going on, it's just that there was nine validators total, which Sky Mavis had access to, uh, I think, eight, uh, uh, five of the eight of the nine. And then five of them was compromised from one of them being um, exploited. And then the hacker was able to get through. There's a there's a whole ongoing updated Substack page or Medium article I think that that's being um, that's being used to update the uh, the community on what's happening and the next steps. So yeah, so the validators that secured the bridge um, were exploited, and now there's 21 validators instead of the initial nine, and they're all different and they're up and running. So. None, this would never happen again. And I say never because it's highly unlikely because of it happening the first time. Right? It's nothing is in absolutes, but right. if there's going to be an exploit now in the future, it's probably less likely to happen from all angles. Because if this happens in one area of, of a weak point, then rest assured that <laughs> why ignore every other poss possibility? They're probably going to hit all bases and then just keep it moving like they did with the launch of Origin. Uh, v3 which you know we'll get into later so I, i'm fairly confident on not so much the funds coming back but with what they just did in a week's time they raised uh a, a 150 million from binance there's big investors still uh unless the the funds come back to the bridge and you have big i guess investors that were from the community not so much these companies sell out because of lack of faith or just waiting too long to do anything with a lot of the assets they have, you know, who knows? There's a lot of here's people. The, uh -huh. Here's a consideration with that though. Before it was their cash. Now they're relying on investment and investors don't invest money without a say yeah. so. So yeah. now what their actual roadmap is, is going to be impacted by the people who are invested that say, hey, here's what I think and here's what I'd like to see. So that is, if we look at, at today and the result of this hack, it is a pivot point as to where we go out 10 years or I mean, 10 years, a long time. If we go out three years from now, what Axie looks like and made us as a company looks like is different than prior to this hack, because now there are people who have a say because they have a governance vote because they are invested in the company in a way that Axie didn't need them before. Great point there, uh, Jesse. And, and you just passed me my tinfoil hat because not only are you 100% correct, but this is a strategy that has been done in the past where you had uh, institutions that were autonomous that were having an effect on society like Axie has mm -hmm. and governments or corporations, competitors did go in and hack them or do what they had to do to shut them down. I mean, you could say something similar about what happened with Tether in the U.S. government where they went and basically shut down their bank accounts and then said they were insolvent. You know, right. you, you've seen these things happen, all you know, with countries and organizations in the past. And Axie 
has had a huge effect on the world since it basically launched this idea of a metaverse. I mean, it kind of started with Axie in a way. So mm -hmm. them being able to take it over and subvert it to whatever kind of designs they want, that's a, that's a powerful idea. They were the first to ever demonstrate to the world that a living wage was possible by playing a game. They were the first to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, some of the some of the new validators, Delphi Digital, Animoca Brands. Uh, we have Dialect, uh, Dialect, <laughs> Dielectric, and then uh, Nansen. So, and then Stable Node. So, there's a lot of people who are still highly interested and invested in the, in the success of Axie Infinity. And you si you see similar names just backing other projects as well that are coming out. So, mm -hmm. just to, depending I'm on trying your to risk. buy the space. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. So. Yeah, we'll see, man. We'll see how it all goes with, um, with the funds. But the usual suspects are out there. <clears throat> what do you guys think about this comment? <clears throat> I wouldn't mind Tornado Cash getting shut down. There is zero good reason to have such tools. I'm 100% against it. And um, the reason is, as you guys know, you know, I'm, I'm of that cypherpunk kind of uh ethos right and so what you're talking about is you're talking about allowing uh we're removing privacy so i think there should be more privacy matter of fact i would like it more if once that eth was stolen you couldn't track it if right. eth had privacy on the base layer i'd be much more happy and you wouldn't need a tornado um but these are secondary solutions to something that should already be happening which is that privacy needs to be a part of the metaverse um it's almost like saying you know, oh, uh, well, because they stole ETH, we shouldn't have ETH anymore. We should go back to dollars. You know, um, you can't take away the innovation and the, and the new technology um, just because uh, somebody's using it for a nefarious purpose. If you go back through any sort of history you want to look at, uh, the criminals are always the ones to first use technology. They have to. They're yeah. in a high risk, very competitive type of situation where they're going to use the new best technology at any given moment. And so even if that technology is allowing for freedom they're going to use it for nefarious purposes um, sure. so i don't think you go and shut down the tool i think what you need to do is up your own security you know um i believe in you know individual sovereignty and individual preparedness not not a uh, uh, censorship and control yeah you're spot on there bonafide it's like the, that comment to me is is fear-based and it leads you in the opposite direction of what you should be focusing on tighten up things over there that's kind of like anyone want to look at that and say you know what we want to we want to have more regulations in place we want to tighten up so people can't do that sort of thing i think we're headed in the wrong direction and you're you're absolutely spot on when you say that it's it's criminals and nefarious and and uh, less than uh, what some people might consider desirable or, or honorable activity that fuels a lot of technology. I mean, the, the internet that you experience today with the security, with the credit card transactions, with membership sites, with the quality of streaming, you all uh, owe all of that to the porn industry. <laughs> Absolutely. People forget that. There was an old song, the internet is for porn, and it <laughs> was factual. That's the thing that nobody ever got. Everybody always laughed at it, but it was actually, I mean, in the beginning, that's what was going on. Yeah. Yep. So uh, that moves us on to one of our next stories about uh, Star Trek launching well, an NFT project. Can I? Can I? Um, Go can we talk about the uh, the Forbes article with Strike, uh, or is that in the in the works up on there? Uh, I don't have it on. But well, okay. It the... Yeah, yeah. It's in the uh, the usual channel that we have on our on our. No problem. Uh, yeah, go ahead and start talking about it, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, uh, Strike announces uh, Shopify integration partnership with NCR and Blackhawk, bringing Bitcoin Lightning Lightning payments to major merchants. So, this is oh, yeah. this was pretty huge news because there's 70 million Cash App users, and they're also going to be uh, on the Lightning network. So, you're going to have a uh, what is it here? It says Forbes under 30 alum. So, uh, Mahler's has also noted that Chicago-based Strike partnered with Blockchain 50's uh, Lister NCR, the world's largest point of sales POS supplier, right? That's the abbreviation there. And then payments uh, firm Blackhawk. So this is some pretty bullish news, I would say. Yeah, it's uh, 
Bitcoiners across the, the, the metaverse and the Twitterverse and all that are going crazy over this right now because this is one step closer to you being able to buy that cup of coffee with Bitcoin. Yeah. So it's it's huge news for uh, crypto as a whole um, and everybody involved in the space. The, the thing I like about when I see articles like this is it reminds me that mainstream has one more reason to accept that crypto is here to stay. It's increasing their comfort level of its existence. While they still don't completely understand how to use it and make use of it, they understand at least that it is now becoming a utility that is going to be a staple that's going to be around. And so now they're feeling more compelled that they want to learn and be a part of it. And for those of us that have met her early, good morning. Uh, this good morning. is great news for us. Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. And, I mean, it's, and, it's that old uh, adage that Bitcoiners have been saying for over a decade now. You know, it's like uh, first they first they laugh at you, you know, then they fight you, you know, and then they join you, right? So there's massive amounts of financial value stored on blockchains right now. And all these corporations, I mean, you put a honeypot anywhere, they're going to go for it. So now they're saying, how do we get access to all this value that's stored in Bitcoin? Well, maybe we can start taking uh, Bitcoin payments. How do we do that? You know, and they then they're the ones that can lobby the government to keep that regulation uh, that we're all so worried about from being too atrocious. So this is a good thing. Like you said, Jesse, this is super bullish. And it actually kind of ties into what the what um, Fancy was about to share next with with um, Star Trek. You know, it's yep. big brands and major corporations saying, look, we see the metaverse forming. We know NFTs are a big buzz and there's a lot of money tied up in it right now. We know that crypto is here to stay. What do we do to get involved? What's our entry point so that we can start staking our claim in the metaverse? And this is Paramount, uh, you know, who, who owns Star Trek, looking for how they can get involved. Live long and prosper. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Trekkie, so I, I dig it. Yeah, I'm, 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 you know, like it's interesting. There's two camps. There's, there's the Star Trek and there's Star Wars. I've always fell into the Star Trek camp. It just made more sense to me. Uh, yeah. But uh, it, yeah. it's ahead. a thing where, like, NFTs, they're leveraging the buzzword. And, and a part of me gets a little frustrated when I see this because right now, metaverse and NFTs are buzzwords that, Every company out there from Walmart to Amazon, doesn't matter who it is, they're trying to figure out how can we align our message with this progressive new frontier that is the metaverse. And this is kind of one of the ways that they're getting involved. But one of the things that doesn't make sense to me, and we touched on this a little bit before the show, doing our little powwows before we jump on here with all you guys. And, and we all have different opinions on this, which is great, as we should. But for me, it's like, here we are again, a company that's promoting an nft now granted its price point is a lot more palatable to the average individual it's like 250 bucks is what they were selling this for and then there was a admiral version that's the captain version the admiral version was also 250 and there's 5,000 of them and it sold out but they didn't do so well with the second one so it's affordable in terms of what we see other nfts going for but still we have no idea what this thing does what chain it sits on, what wallet it works with, nothing like that at all. Just buy yourself a Star Trek NFT and be one of the cool kids. I like your framing, Jesse, because you you view it as, as a, or you framed it sort of as a possible threat, right? And, you know, thinking about it along those lines, I kind of agree with you. So first of all, I like the, I like what they're doing. I like the idea. It seems cool. I'm a Trekkie. It seems cool to be able to go buy a little $250 ticket and have access to the content, right? That they're going to have. They're, you're supposed to be able to go and go through their space, little metaverse or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And it seems cool. It's kind of like you're going to be part of the TV show kind of thing. But at the same time, as you said, they're selling it as an NFT, right? So I've heard Gary V and some some stars, some celebs kind of speak about NFTs as sort of like a like a, a concert ticket, right? So you, you're buying access to them. You're buying access to them, but you don't own anything. Right. Then those of us who come from crypto, we think about NFTs as ownership. Hey, I own this thing and I own 
a part of this ecosystem because I own this thing or I own a part of this community. So these are two very different perspectives that are both being built out live in front of us right now. And you would hope to see sort of a separation where we start using different terms because they are two different things. You're not buying control or you're not having ownership in the Star Trek universe by buying this NFT. NFT. All you're going to be able to do is access the content, which is very different than uh, what we're buying as as like a, in a, in like a Star Atlas or something like that. Their plans are quite interesting uh, though. Uh, So the season zero starships will get crew airdrop to them later. And Mm -hmm. then uh, they can use their crew to go on missions in a play to earn game. Star Atlas? Uh, oh, we're talking no. about Star Trek. Star Trek, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, so, that's a good one. So, yeah, it's, it's a, a lot of these space games, specifically, are requiring crews for ships and ships to fly and resources to mine and to, you know, to warp drive. You need all these modules. Like, it's almost the same type of gameplay because it's the same genre. But a lot of these companies that are traditional companies are needing to stay relevant in some way. And if most attention is going into this new age of Web3 and decentralization and crypto gaming. You know, it's all, I could imagine the boardroom meetings where it's just like, okay, how can we profit off of this first and foremost? Mm -hmm. Because they're just not going to disappear as Star Trek. Disney isn't just going to disappear. None of these companies are just going to just evaporate, but they want to make money. So their bottom line is how can we get now a team of minds to hire out? Do you know how many positions, even fast food restaurants, everyone is hiring crypto savvy individuals whether they came from a four-year anniversary or not just because they just need people who are understanding of the space and who are economists in their own right depending if they have a degree or not um, from the space to then help them along to make money Um, and that's just where we're at right now it's just it's like a a mad dash to stay relevant and make money and to me, it's it's honestly a threat to what I think the, the metaverse can be for a lot of reasons. And the reason and, and the primary one is that the corporations are profit driven first. They're not right. focused on the value of the individual. And what we've seen is that while the product of most corporations uh, end up being things that they think that we want to buy, ultimately in scenarios like this, we become the product and our data right. and our behavior become the product. And so for me, that doesn't really... Uh, support the kind of metaverse that I want to see develop. Fancy, if you go back to those ships, there's, there's something that's missing on there we didn't see before. So when uh, Fancy Hat and I were talking about this before the show, you see how it says the sale is completed of this captain pack? It says 3,381 have been sold. You know how many they had for sale? 15,000. They were that far off the mark. However, the one below it, which is the Admiral's pack, uh, this one here had 5,000 available, and they're not even showing the amount on that one anymore. So it's kind of like, <laughs> as a team, it shows you they were off the mark. They had a target, right. and like, ooh, that didn't work out. So now they're redirecting the numbers to yep. try and support their case for whatever they want the scenario and narrative yeah. to be now. Well, like like what we were talking about before the show, Jesse, um, their community isn't fully backing the idea of NFTs. So a lot of these uh, institutions who have huge followings, I mean, the Star Trek, they're, they're, they have huge followers. They have these uh, these big uh, events all over where they all dress up and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, all those people don't support NFTs, and so they might put a number out there projecting that they have these many fans, when in reality those fans aren't going to come and buy these NFTs. I wanted to give a, a shout out right quick to OCG Thor from the chat. You you basically sound bited exactly what I was trying to say there, brother. Thank you. Both utility NFT but one is ownership NFT and one is membership NFT. These are two different types of things. Yeah. But it ties into this, this other comment here of, you know, it would be interesting to sell ships compatible with Star Atlas. So he's talking about Star Trek ships being compatible with Star Atlas. <laughs> now that's not going to happen, right? Because Star Trek is going to be trying to silo itself. They're going to be trying to keep yeah. their community separate. Whereas a Star Atlas mm-hmm. who's talking about decentralizing himself they're going to be talking about trying to bring assets from other communities in and also let their assets go out. So these are the, this is a, a perfect example, going back to what Thor is saying, of the different types of perspectives. And I'm with you, Jesse. I think the the membership idea, the 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 soloing, the siloing of your community idea um, is dangerous because some people might not catch on quick enough. 
but I think it, eventually it's going to fail just like AOL did. So part of my, in, in a past life, I come from a world of doing uh, reputation management consulting and community building and social media uh, consulting for Fortune 500 companies. The one thing, and I share this because the one thing that I don't see these companies doing and here's how I would approach it. We saw Ubisoft fail because their fans are like, eh, we're not going to buy it. Star Trek, Trekkies are giving pushback. The place they should always begin here is they should create kind of a scenario, kind of like Lord of the Rings did, where they rounded up, they created a blog and said, hey, fans, we're not going to make this movie till we have some buy-in from you guys and what you think we should be doing. How much hair should be on a hobbit's foot? You know what I mean? So get your Trekkies together uh, and, and say, look, guys, help us to make the best metaverse version of a playable earn to play, uh, uh, play to earn game. And for doing that, we're gonna give you some Genesis NFTs just for helping us to sort this out. Then when they go to launch, then they could sell these NFTs, but now they already have a whole community that's supporting the project in the process. And they're not gonna get this kind of pushback. They're approaching it the wrong way. And yeah, you, you uh, just hit it on the head. Cause you're saying you basically just outlined them instead of doing the membership nft to do the ownership nft instead but that is almost viewed as toxic to people who have absolute power over their ip mm -hmm. you know they don't want right. to give that kind of stuff up and then this brings us into the conversation of cco nfts right so there was there's a whole kind of narrative that's forming around the uh, creative commons licensing of NFTs and what you're able to do because you actually own and purchased the NFT, but you have full rights to using it in any way, shape or form you see fit, whether it's the profit or just to make hats to wear yourself, right? And not get sued if you're walking down the street <laughs> and then the company sees it, right? Uh, but anyways, there's a, a couple of projects like we know of like Yuga Labs and the uh, Board API clubs. And then there's those crypto toads and then you got uh, MFers. So, uh, these are all projects and there's more and more that are coming up because now what what everyone wants is interoperability. That's what the, the word that's kind of used where you buy an asset in one game and you could play with it in another. And then there, that that IP, you know, or the uh, is shared amongst different projects. So Nifty Island is a project that is actually open to that and supports it with a scarce land model, which, you know, we could talk about later because I have it as a, one of the talking points for the games that I'm interested in. And they've always been this way since I first got involved. It's just now that this narrative is coming around. They seem to be more in the 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 uh, the conversation because they just like we see with um, World Wide Web, right? Uh, that, that was a project I talked about in an earlier Nomad episode. I briefly covered it with DeFi Kingdoms at the time. Um, and you're able to use your crypto dick butt, right? Or your Avogachi uh, NFT or your MF -er, or your, your Cyber Kongs. Uh, pick pick one almost, and you can essentially log in, connect your wallet address, and play as that avatar. And it's 2D. It's more of like a retro 2 d -er, right, uh, uh, of a game. But there's a whole game being developed around all of these NFTs that give the ability to their to their purchasers or owners uh, uh, to do anything, right? So we see Ninja Turtles coming out of nowhere, right? Announcing NFTs, right? You're gonna have the, everyone coming into NFTs, but you need to be able to discern why and and if it's even worth doing it unless you're a fan because a lot of these projects are just appealing to their previous fan base they're not innovating really anything about the company they could build a game you know out of something because they have the funds but at that point the majority of attention and money is consolidated and it's being distributed in a way from like the top down where the people got in first early there's yeah. investors that made a lot of money that are building exchanges and video games from all those earnings and it's just like the, the ecosystem is being penetrated <laughs> right from the traditional world in a way where if you've been here long enough you'll know that it's just a cash grab or yeah. if they have the, the the values and morals build something that's gonna go into this new age of um, technology and and decentralization there's going to be a lot of cash grabs and i think that that the way that a lot of corporations uh, are are approaching it now uh, is kind of what's 
not really helping with the reputation of what the industry yeah. can be. If I go back to like this lady here, this comment on Twitter, stop making NFTs, please, Star Trek, stop. We don't want it. <laughs> it's, it's hurting. Like, lady, it's hurting. Lady, do you even know what an NFT, could you even like, uh, you know, enunciate the acronym, you know? <laughs> it's, it's insane. I've, I've had people oh, interacting with my Twitter post, Jesse, like <laughs> NFT cringe, you know, you know, get out of my feed with this. I've seen people on, you know, on Twitter, like there's almost like a, uh, it's almost becoming like a visceral response of, yeah. of hate towards NFTs, which it's like we gotta fight back. You, it's like it's like well, it's like you hate you hate a fork. Point the finger. You, and you hate you hate you hate a spoon. Like what do you what do you mean you hate NFTs? Like what you, like you don't right, even right. understand it's what it is. Lack of understanding for it because even as you mentioned before the show here is that, and I believe this, and I think that is the power of blockchain. Eventually, voting will be on chain. It'll be verifiable. Eventually, hopefully, we have you know, where your tax dollars go or a charitable contribution. When you pay money, you can see where that money goes. If does it go all the way to actually building wells and clean water and medical aid or education, or is it just going to fund the people that run the project? You'll be able to see these things because they're on chain. And even if it's a movie ticket or a concert ticket, and how cool would it be if you went to this festival and that NFT a year later got you into this really cool party, or they sent you some commemorative thing thereafter. So NFT and in, in, in mainstream minds now that doesn't understand it because of the way the term is being abused means that people just see it as a money grab for companies rather than see the underlying power of what NFTs and the concept of a non-fungible token can do for everyday life. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're I think you're right, Jesse. You, you, as, you know, Gary Vee has talked about this as well. Like, you know, eventually we're gonna come to a point where, you know, people are gonna be able to like you know, see each other's public wallets and be like, oh, you went to that concert? I went to that concert too. And these will be like talking points and things that people bond over is your 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 NFT uh, crypto history, you know, right. where you've been, what you've done and how they've moved in similar ways. I just, I'm just reminiscing. I was nostalgic to have these similar conversations and thoughts of that I had back in 2016 about the technology that's underlining all of this innovation because it, it is going to change the world in, in the way we're kind of talking about we see it happening slowly but surely and then even before gary v got into the space right when his first appearance came on right he started talking about it and entertaining it as and learning it as what it is it was just like everyone in, it was like a clubhouse of individuals of of like willing or not willing to invite people in from the traditional world it was that closed off of like a community when it came to nfts and specific you know crypto was always a thing that you could get in or get out do what you want but there wasn't any hardcore community outside of ethereum i think uh bitcoin did earlier on but yeah i'm just going down the 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 old memory lane here uh, but it, it's just amazing how the these tribes or clicks and strong opinions are shaped around the space as a whole and then particular projects the tribalism of it all right i mean you're going to see things in the future where i mean not that there would be a, a you know burning man nft for you know say 2023 but what imagine 10 years now there's an alumni and the way that you know you actually go to an event is you're an nft holder from that particular year that you know is kind of ends up being a reunion so you'll be able to track things like that and there will i think there will be value in that so the whole concept of how we can use uh, anything on chain, it, it, it becomes the trustless system that we need. So NFTs are actually a beautiful and powerful thing that are just being misrepresented right now. And at the end of the day, mainstream just truly needs to be educated on all the things we can do within the metaverse as a result of, uh, of uh, crypto and things on chain. And I'll keep shouting from the mountaintops. I mean, really, it's it's on us. It's on it those is. of us that are here now to educate the people that are coming in and stay strong on the principles that created crypto in the first place, which created Bitcoin, which was decentralization, uh, privacy, freedom, uh, no, no single points of failure. You know, the code is law, trustless. These are the kind of things that we needed to be demanding. And so when you see something like a Star Trek coming along, it has none of these principles. And you're like, uh, you know, OK, so you view it like a movie, but you're not going to be willing to invest too much of your time and your energy there. 
and then you see something like a star atlas and you're yeah. like well, okay well if these guys do what they're saying they're going to do that's that's a possibility you know maybe we can invest something serious there so you know you gotta you gotta keep that perspective close to you otherwise you're going to find yourself in these situations where you're going to get burned or disappointed uh this might be a good segue into the uh the crypto.com nft there jesse <laughs> <laughs> yes, but before we, we jump into that real quick here, and, and it is a great, perfect segue into that. One of the things I wanted to add was that, you know, one of the things I've been doing lately, I've been trying to figure out how to educate myself on how to better explain where the metaverse is going. That's kind of like where I feel like I want to spend more time and in, in to add more value to what is being created, to be an active part of that. And one of the things I've been learning recently, and some of you watching this may already know, but there's pretty much three main as aspects to decentralization that need to be considered for like all projects and what the metaverse can become. One of those is decentralized architecture. Uh, the other is political decentralization. And then the third is logical. And while I'm still wrapping my head around the logical decentralization aspect, um, the other two are fairly clear. The architecture, uh, you guys remember Parler, um, which was a social network that got shut down by Amazon because mm -hmm. they were the last residing place where people could go and speak their minds openly without getting tagged as fake news or getting canceled. And so uh, when people started flocking there, Amazon shut them down. Why? Because Amazon was the architecture. They did not yet have a way to be decentralized on architecture. And then if we look at the political side of decentralization, we see social media camped out there too. I mean, social media, Twitter shut down the POTUS, okay? An elected official, regardless of what you think of what he had to say or how he got there, he was the elected president of the United States and Twitter shut him down. Okay. Never liked the guy, and that still scared the shit out of me. Yes, that's and and you see thing, and then another area of, of where where social media has done that is Alex Jones. Again, he was he's an inflammatory figure, and uh, you know out of Austin, Texas. And regardless of what you think about what he says, he was the first target because he was the easiest target because people would say, "Yeah, he." We can see why you would want to shut him down, but that's the first domino to fall. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, when you start canceling people uh, for what they have to say, that's where, again, decentralization comes in to where people should be able to say whatever they want. You as a responsible human can choose not to listen to them. So therefore, turn the channel. But you don't shut the person down. You never want anybody to be silenced. I mean, that's you, you. There's so many reasons why freedom of speech is important. But going back to what you said about Amazon shutting people down. Uh, a fact that's not talked about enough is that Ethereum runs on AWS. <laughs> right. And people, uh, you know, I mean, this is one of the things that Bitcoiners have been and cypherpunks have been talking about forever as far as all these different uh, altcoins, as they, as they call them, right? Is that a lot of these things are not nearly as decentralized as they need to be when the, uh, when the attacks come. Right. So, yeah, man, at the end of the day, I want a system that, uh, you know, those things don't happen. There's not someone for political reasons can get shut down. There's not someone that can take away your architecture. And then where the logical side comes in is that if half of the architecture, if half of the servers go away, the rest can rebuild itself. That's kind of where the logical side of decentralization comes in. So that's that's honestly, those are the components that I'm focused on lately because I think that that is what's going to build the, the foundation for the metaverse that we all see and that we want to participate in. But uh, with that, yeah, now we're going to switch over to some 420. <laughs> 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 and so we were having a conversation about this because as, for those of you that follow uh, Gala Games, you know that Gala now has Gala Music and their, their centerpiece of Gala Music is their relationship with Snoop Dogg. Well, Snoop, was involved in nfts before he got involved with gala and, and of course you know that because you know that he's got stuff in um crap now i always get to central land and sandbox sandbox, mixed up. Yeah. sandbox. sandbox. And sandbox. there was an article uh not too long ago of someone spending like four hundred fifty thousand dollars just to camp out next door to, to snoop's place there but snoop has been actively participating in nfts for quite some time and this is actually one that I was interested in it for quite some time. And I remember it even when it came out. I think it first released for 250 bucks. And then I didn't buy it. And then I saw later it was 750. 
Uh, and then later it was almost a thousand. And like a couple of weeks ago, I was still going to go back there. And I was just talking to the guys about it here before the show. And now it's already up to 1500 and it's slowly climbing. And all it is, it's an NFT song. It's uh, and it's called uh, diamond joint. Uh, so if, if you've got the ability to play that, we'll listen in here for just a moment, but this thing is climbing in value. NFT, never forget to pass it. Quickest way to get your motherfucking ass kicked. Smoking big while I'm bouncing in the classic. No cap, I don't even got a gas it. When the weed come around, real shit, two puffs, nigga, pass it. I only want that loud talk. Oh, you got it, roll it up and me sample it. Keep an eye on my weed, cause if I don't, it'll disappear like magic. We don't gotta play the whole thing, but you can just the light up. What are you doing? <laughs> All right, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're gonna play the whole song, but the idea here is that it is it is very Snoop for sure. And for those of us that that appreciate his music, appreciate his persona, appreciate his past, and all the things that he, he is he has brought to to uh, to the world through his lens, it's I can see. And here's what's interesting: there were other more expensive things uh, that related to his childhood and related to, to other aspects of how the crypto.com when they launched, by the way, I think this was their first NFT launch. It was sometime yeah. last year. About it a was, year it was, it was definitely in the, in the, in the suite of their first NFT yeah. launch, if not their first one. I remember when they first got into NFTs and this was right there that time. This particular one is the one that is appreciated in value most because I just think when people think of Snoop, they think in joint diamond joint, and it's a song. As we're now on, well, this song's uh, been used a lot too. I think uh, I think yeah. Golly even played it a couple times. Like there's been this this is the song that's been played the most, right? So you know, so it's interesting to see how celebrities are entering the space, and I don't know if there's actually been a celebrity that has probably experimented more in the space than snoop you guys think of me because i even know that through steve aoki steve aoki is actually the og he's actually been in nfts before snoop, actually black he's he's even oh, OG there you go. Steve aoki. was that right okay. i don't yeah, even know who Blau Blau is, so yeah yeah so he's a big um what do you call it like edm like dj oh okay so he was before um, steve and so is he steve so he's before yeah him. but he okay. is the one who came around first and he was trying which he's still doing is doing both where you get the nft where there's a, a music in it right and then it's all so no, none of this is technically new if you've kind of been here but if you only follow snoop dog you're going to now know about nfts and then not know of any maybe well, i think i know coming. i think i know about that guy that's the guy that was releasing his albums as nfts already and he was releasing like the the music and the and the little video and all that right uh that you're talking about, Ray? Sure about the video um but yeah but it's similar to what it, people are doing now like snoop and then you know uh, right. steve aoki and um there's a female artist who does who's going on tour and selling like eggs she was trying to gamify i don't even like, i don't even keep up with celebrity names or nothing like that so i just it comes across my table as in like of course i mean then with snoop dogg and even with gary v and then even with um what's his name uh, the youtuber that we bought those legendary pasts i mean you guys um uh, the influencer oh the, tom the, Billy. Tom mm -hmm. Billy, Tom Billy. Right? So yeah. these people are, or even Paris Hilton, none of these people are relatively new into the space. Uh, the, not necessarily, I'm sorry, not, they're not, they haven't been here, right? In, to, in right. the space as far as understanding it and learning how it works, but being approached from, from within the NFT space for business opportunities or business deals, right? So I could, I could imagine, and this is, I've heard this happening already that people are trying to within their own games that they're creating appeal to a Snoop Dogg appeal to uh, a Paris Hilton, like build something, create an, F an, an, an NFT exclusively for them, drop it in their wallet. So there's a tension that could be had on, on the projects part. So, you know, for what it's worth, Snoop Dogg likes to make money. He's not stupid. You know, he got people, whether it's him doing his business planning and financial accounting or it's someone else who's the marketer saying, this is what we got to do next. Snoop Dogg is probably smoking a joint like, yeah, let's do it. Whatever makes the bottom line grow. He has, like, a, I'm, I'm he has down. a skit. He has a skit where he uh, he calls like his his crypto guy or his accountant or whatever. And he's like, "Hey, uh, how much sand I got?" And the guys like, uh, "You mean your sandbox token?" He's like, "Yeah, how much?" And he's like, "It was like I don't know. The number was like four million or something." He was like, "Sell it." 
<laughs> so, so, so he's like, you know, kind of kind of stunned on a skit, yeah. right? And then, and, and so and this rapper. is this this is like a this is this is the thing oh. that that's important about. Well, I agree with what you were saying, Ray. No, but, Floyd Mayweather um, is even in it too. He's he, there was a, there was a whole tweet, uh, Twitter storm and uproar about uh, Floyd making a video and you can probably search it up it's probably still trending or whatever i'm not maybe not trending but there's a there's another rapper i forget his little something because I, I just lost the, the whole timeline with the littles in front of the uh in front of the names and 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 floyd wayweather is just literally creating nfts to sell them to make money like what other he's got caught are, up he's got caught up for a scam and a couple times already on that too yeah i but but still they could weather all these scams and then make something can make it all back because there's that 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 support of the community mm-hmm. who are fans, just like with Star Trek and Snoop Dogg and, you know, like Eminem, pick a person, there's going to be people who buy their NFTs. So again, but without understanding and without under, like the nuances and, and how to discern what's the point even of it and all. That's, that's my question. What shop, you know, what shopping channel here has mm-hmm. got to say is like, what if someone wants to jump out with an NFT, my question is going to be, what is the utility of that NFT? Now, mm-hmm. in the case of with this diamond joint here for me, I can see just buying that for nostalgia because it was it was the Snoop's first kind of NFT releases. And that is, I mean, to me, it doesn't get any more Snoop than this as an NFT release. So I could see just hanging on to this, not expecting any utility other than the fact that I own this for nostalgic purposes. And there are going to be times where that might make sense. But for those that are just releasing stuff to make money and to release it, and they don't really pack a lot of nostalgic punch, they're going to have to show up and demonstrate what the utility is behind that NFT. Why should I buy it? Yeah, I think Ray was making it. a good. I think Ray was making a good point because, um, except for the Tom Bill you point, because Tom actually came into NFTs as part of his crypto journey. He went into crypto first, discovered right, right. NFTs, and then was like, "Oh, I could use this for something I'm already right. trying to create." Whereas a lot of people in the space, like you said, are actually looking at like I. I you're not going to tell me Snoop's not looking at this like, oh, I can make money. OK, let's do it. Right. Because here's the thing is that artists are used to selling merch. They're used to selling T-shirts at their concert. Now, they don't they're not expected to support that T-shirt for the next 10 years after they sell it to you. It's a T-shirt. They sold it. It's gone. Right. They don't they don't care about that T-shirt anymore. And so that's the, the risk you run when you're buying NFTs based off of or uh, being promoted by a celebrity is are they selling it just to sell it? And it's yours and you can you know have it as nostalgia or are they going to support it into the future and so like with this crypto.com nft first of all crypto.com is super centralized they're my favorite exchange actually to be honest but um i don't trust them and i wouldn't buy anything locked into their platform so my first question would be going back to what i was talking about earlier how to centralize this can i move this nft to a different platform how can i use it what and like you were saying what's the utility right so snoop's evolution has been he did that then he started messing with gala then he released some more nfts on his own that he was selling on twitter i got a couple of those um and i have one of his gala ones which are to me more decentralized than the crypto.com stuff right Mm -hmm. um now do i trust gala (laughs) i mean you know i think we all know how i feel about gala i don't super trust gala but i trust them I trust their level of decentralization or commitment to decentralization more than I trust crypto.coms. Yeah. So, you know, it's a, it's an interesting space to be in, you know, definitely not something that you should be, uh, you know, diving in too deep. I don't think at this point, because these celebrities can kind of be fickle and, you know, I don't think any of them are really trying to build something where they're trying to reward their community financially, unless you're talking about, like I said, like a Tom bill, you, who who actually is trying to build something where the community is going to be rewarded? Yeah, you, you know, at, I think. Go ahead, Ray. Right, no, I was going to say at this point it's a lifestyle. Like being in Web three gaming or crypto in general, it, you need to incorporate it in your life at on some level where it's just not a fly by moment. I hear, I hear a lot of stories that I have conversations in uh, with people that I have conversation with. A lot of the times are yeah, I I, I knew of it back in you know, 20, you know, 2009 or eight or whatever. And then I kind of thought nothing of it. And then I got back in at 2017 and then I invested in some, some NFTs and then I, I kind of just forgot about it. And then now I'm, now I'm back in 2022 and I should have, could have, man, I felt, you know, yeah. upset. And, and it's just like, well, 
the understanding for one didn't get you all the way through uh, involved, right? Keeping keeping the interest there. But then when it comes to these uh, celebrities that we're talking about, it's just like everyone is technically on the same path, whether they're doing it themselves or being told what to do. And if you're doing it yourself, it takes a lot of time from what your life is already. And I don't know how many people's lives want to change in a way where you're sitting in front of a computer when you could delegate that by paying and hiring, and, and you know, which is a smart thing to do if you're already a business that's successful and your time is better spent somewhere else. But I would, uh, I would, you know, fight against that. And so your, your, your time is best spent in this place if you're going to be living for the next 50 years or 20 or 30, right? Because t- this is all accelerating and it's going to be something that's just commonplace like credit cards were, like, like cell phones were. And, you know, you know pick one, uh, pick, a, pick an invention that we all use today that just was introduced. The internet, right? The perfect one right there. So, you know, actually, you just made me think about something. I got to go back in Snoop's defense because I was in a space with him a couple weeks ago and he was actually talking about Death Row being the first NFT record label. And so I do think that this is something that he's passionate about. One of the interesting things. So Gala Music had an interview and they had him, uh, Chad Medici and uh, oh no, not Chad Medici, Ice Cube and some new artists that they mm-hmm recently just launched uh, a couple of music NFTs for as well. They just sold out of them. Um, but Ice Cube is somebody that I actually trust. Like Ice Cube, if uh, you know his history, that's back with NWA when he wouldn't sign the deal that everybody else signed. He was smart enough not to sign the deal. And he's actually kind of protected his IP um, in an admirable way, almost like on a Prince level as far as artists mm-hmm. are concerned. And so yeah. He hasn't, as far as I know, necessarily, you know, signed in, in, in blood or anything with Gala yet, but he's actually vetting them now, which is an interesting thing for me to see. So I, I think if Ice Cube was to jump on board with Gala, I don't know. I might have to I might have to reevaluate. So when you listen to Snoop, does it do you get a sense that he understands the the, the, the marketplace or is it just, you know what, this is an opportunity? I think he's starting to, I think he's changing. I think we're watching him change because in the beginning, like I said, like I just told you about that skit. I mean, obviously the guy that made that skit was not, <laughs> didn't, didn't get what you could do with NFTs fully or what you could do with crypto fully um, because he's obviously still valuing dollars over his crypto, right? Which is yeah. a kind of a perspective. You start to lose the deeper you get in the space. Um, however, um, the way he's talking about controlling his music you know and and not getting you know because as we all know the record labels the music industry record labels have been some of the most uh um controlling of, yeah. of anybody you know they're they're basically uh what do you call it when you you got a guy i can't think of the word when the guy controls the country dictatorship right they're they're a, a hardcore dictatorship and they control the artists. They won't let them launch on certain days. They won't let them launch in certain ways. They control the content, the wording sometimes, all of that. And so what NFTs is allowing is for the community to actually fund the artist directly by buying the album without anybody being involved. True. And so um, that, and I think Snoop ha- sees that now, which I don't think he has necessarily saw that when he put those NFTs out on crypto.com. But I think he starts. I think he's starting to understand that now when he starts talking about having Death Row being the first NFT label, and now he's trying to get uh, Cube. They were talking about Mount Westmore. I just saw the Mount Westmore co- uh, concert out in Tennessee. So that's Snoop E40. That's a, several artists who've all been very right. independent in the past. E40, uh, Too Short. These guys have never. They were independent forever. They were selling out the trunk of their cars forever because they didn't want to sign these 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 deals. So speaking of which, man, independent labels, did you see what uh, um, what happened recently with um, like, who the heck was it? It was Tom McDonald. He just did a call out, a major call out to the music industry as an independent artist because he he shared online transparently his challenge with billboards. Uh, and how billboard doesn't get their own data and how they go to this independent company and how they tried to provide him with all this information showing that, look, if you use the information that we can demonstrate through our own shopping cart and through all the stuff that we provided you, we would be number one on the billboards. This is another instance where if this was NFT sales, it would make a difference because NFTs is in this bubble right now because you sprinkle the name NFT on it. People think it's magical and it does something different. If you mm-hmm. were to remove the word NFT and you were simply say, Hey, look, 
this thing that you just purchased has a serial number, there's a limited supply, and we can track it to you. And even if there's not a limited supply, we can still track it to you because it has a serial number. That's essentially what an NFT means at this point. And if you had that, there's a lot more that you can understand about its use, especially independent labels. You guys haven't seen that. There's actually, it's it's an important video for the music industry that he just put out within the past week or so that full on calls out the whole industry and the, and the corruption within Billboard's you know, uh, music uh, hierarchy. Yeah, it's it, it's a uh, it's a thing that's gonna happen in every industry, right? So it's just the beginning. And if let's say music takes off, you know, gaming seems to be the one, but it's not tracking any particular goods or commodities like across like for for food, for example, like shipping of food, right? There could be a QR code that can monitor the temperature and if it went bad or not, and if and if how many how many times the truck stopped because there's nothing tracking any of this. It just gets there right. when it gets there. So it could yeah. and then for car manufacturers, right? Where your car is being shipped, where you bought it from, what piece, what every where every piece is and where it came from and where it was manufactured. All this could be living on the blockchain. You know your right. your certificates your you know, your school burns down, you still have your NFT of certification from uh, graduation or birth certificates, marriage licenses. Like, oil so, and fossil fuels. Like uh, people wonder why, like, you know, why, why, why oil, the price of oil goes up during war, but then it doesn't go back down all of a sudden when it's, when it's over. Or how, <laughs> that whole fluctuation. If you right. were to see these things on chain, then people could audit. It becomes a yeah. well, just like, uh, just like web one, you know, disrupted everything. You know, Web two, Web three, they're gonna disrupt every aspect of of our lives. But I think that gaming is the the freer, lower hanging fruit in a way that's gonna really onboard a lot of people the quickest. And I think that, but I think that music is actually more interesting because, like I said, I mean, you have that that music uh, dictatorship, and it's almost like a like they're the mafia. You know, yep. you, you can't put out music without coming in and kissing the ring. Right. Yep. And so this, you know, you know, I mean, just going back and, and looking at like what was that Napster back in the day and all those things that have happened in the past. Anytime anybody tried to approach the music industry, they got rocked and shut down. Yep. Um, so now Gala is is coming out swinging against one of these titans like this, which is I mean, it's, it's way different to say you're going to decentralize gaming to say you're going to decentralize the music industry. So I, I find this very interesting. And, you know, I think they need these moguls in the space because you, you got Snoop. I mean, he's a powerful individual in the music industry. Let's 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 be straight. And then they got Kings of Leon. They got Steve Aoki. They, they got some heavy hitters um, that are that are back in this move. So it's going to be interesting to watch this play out. We well, why do you think they would go that wide, though? Like was that? movies. Why do you think Gala would choose to go that wide and choose that many potential enemies at um, one time? You know, and that's that kind of goes back to why we're all so nervous about Gala. I mean, so, and I you've mentioned this before. You know, when you're innovating, you know, you got to keep it, you got to keep that surplus of cash coming in, so that you can continue to focus on innovating and growth and speed and all that. Time is of the essence, right? And I, I see them doing that. And you got to respect it. At the same time, I'm not seeing that foundation being laid either. You know what I mean? That strong foundation that they're going to be able to fall back on when they get when they get because you're going to get punched eventually, right? Yep. Now, how are you going to take that punch if you're if you're not on stable footing? And I don't see the stable footing, and that's you know that kind of worries me a little bit, especially because like you say, it's like okay, we got gaming going on now, it's music, now we're doing movies, and really what they're doing is just selling, selling, selling more NFT, more NFT, more NFT. Um, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with this music industry thing. Are we ready to move on to Star Atlas? Let's do yeah, it. Boy. Cool. So, um, yeah, on the, I like the way they have uh, done the roadmap this week. There's uh, titles to each uh, segment, and you can see what's being done, what's coming up. Uh, also, bug, fi bug fixes, new features. So we'll just uh, go through a few of them. On the showroom, they're working on title screens, in-game menus, and fast travel mock-ups. So it does sound like most of the interior, possibly the exterior, is done. Because uh, they released this picture this week. 
and uh, nice. yeah, it does look really so good at, at night too. So perhaps that be a changing event as we play in the future. Mm-hmm. And we've uh, seen that these hands before as like props. So uh, now that they're in, they weren't before. You can see in this picture, mm-hmm. but yeah, yeah we haven't seen uh, reality. Yeah. We haven't seen any of the updates in a while, so I, I kind of expect a trailer or another showroom video like this to uh, be released again soon. Yeah. Because it mm-hmm. it's not very furnished inside here, but there has been a lot of like sneak peeks recently. The sound of those footsteps kill me every time I hear them. <laughs> <laughs> Bitter patter. <laughs> Yeah, and it's just unfortunate that a lot of people just see this from the traditional gaming space of space genre games and say, oh, when they when he went into the hull uh, or to the back end of the ship, you know, uh, it looks like crap. You know, and it's just like, of course, every game is going to have something that's not fully developed yet as this was just released to show what's coming for the showroom. You know, like, I don't, I don't understand. I'm more patient, I guess, where it's like all of these things are great to see, but it's not scratching my itch fully because we actually want the full game to come out it's staking and everything else that was talked about or uh, but you know if you're gonna if you're gonna act that way then just you'll be playing destiny for the rest of your life or, or you know eve well, online for the rest of your life people don't understand time horizon that's the difference between you right. you know who i would say is a successful investor because you know how to you, you understand being patient and understanding that you know, uh, short-term gratification is where it's at. It's all about, you know, sitting there and finding something good for the long haul. A lot of people just don't see the the world that way. Surprisingly few people see the world that way, in my opinion. As I as I go on, I'm starting to realize that. Well, it's yeah. not the usual audience. I mean, normally if you're a gamer and you get a release like this, you're like, okay, cool, but I'm not invested in it. Uh, it's not, it, it's not going to give me the same wow as the experience that I hope to get from playing the game as we're now is as most people are investors in these projects and games, this is kind of like an investor update, which is different than a fan based game update of, Hey, here's right. the cool game that's coming. And so right. it's a different audience. And so it should be received in a different way. And I think people are confusing the two. I think you're right. That's a good point. Jess. Yep. But I'm excited to see what what we're going to be able to do with this showroom. You know, I'm sure there'll be some surprises, like that day and night cycle. Like, if that's going to be a thing, that's awesome. Yeah, we'll see what else they, they surprise us with. Yeah, I agree. And this week, uh, they added uh, some cookie enhancements and the uh, Taurus wallet integration. I haven't used that wallet before, but it's good that we're getting more options. Like Phantom kind of has uh, dominance over Solana right now. What was the cookie? And we added chocolate chips. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> what do you? I mean, it's it's interesting they add that, but I don't I don't even understand what what that means for us. Um, I think it was just like a terms of service agreement thing when you joined. Uh, I got you. I remember that. Yeah, like when you signed your wallet to the mm-hmm. StarAtlas dot com. Uh, website yeah you know they have the connected supported wallets and then they have the connected limited uh supported wallets and so let actually got deranked from the supported wallets and then you have taurus there so yeah you got soul flare taurus and, and phantom as the supported ones and then yeah if you notice the ledger uh, and so on speaking of which i did want to add this kind of as a public service announcement and i shared with you, with you guys before the show here but i just had a pretty traumatic experience yesterday and fortunately i prepared for it because i actually do have a protocol for restoring a hardware wallet but just so you know um hardware wallets fail all hardware fails doesn't matter if it doesn't have moving parts literally yesterday i came in and i went to update my ships in star atlas and my thumb drive wouldn't turn on. And then when it did turn on, it started going through a reboot cycle in 1%. It took five hours for my thumb drive to go through this entire cycle. And when it was done, it was reset, which means that I had no choice but to completely go through and restore my wallet. So, and I've mentioned this on the show again uh, in the past, but be sure that you have practiced your protocol for restoring, because if you haven't practiced it once, you don't have any security that you'll be able to do it successfully. So there's an actual way within your 
hardware, you can go in and actually go through and add the key phrase just to make sure you have it correct and set up because, uh, yeah, it's, it's a little traumatic moment when you've got a whole lot of assets in your hardware wallet and you have to reset the process. Now, one of the things, my takeaway and the thing reason I wanted to share this is it said on the Ledger site that one of the reasons that a hardware wallet will do that is because it's a security response to a potential threat or attack. And I have a bad habit of sometimes of leaving my drive connected to USB. And so I don't know if that was the case, but my takeaway from this is that when I'm done using it, I disconnect it, even though you still have to enter in a pin. So just putting that out there because it's something that I went through and it's a frightening thing when you have a lot of assets in a wallet and your question is, can I actually complete the restore process? On the other side of that, I spent quite a bit of time uh, this weekend on OpenSea. You can like uh, send NFTs to your different wallets and it's actually pretty cheap. It wasn't costing me more than like 10 bucks a transfer this weekend. So I was able to move quite a few NFTs around and, and put them in, uh, in safer situations and whatnot. So good timing to, to maneuver your stuff in the hardware wallets. If you haven't done it yet, make sure you, uh, you know, if you, if you don't know what a hardware wallet is, make sure you do your studying first and, and move uh, small amounts first, you know, but yeah. it's definitely a, a good feeling once you know that nobody can take your stuff unless you give up your keys. And, and by the way, as as um, as uh, Clement here is mentioning, it is good to have a backup because in the event in the event that this fails, you can restore to a new hardware wallet. But again, it still gets back to you. do you have the process down where you know you can go through with your key phrase and restore. So there's two components. One, if this failed, I need to restore it to something else. So if I'm trying to rely on refueling ships in Star Atlas. I got to wait until a new hardware wallet is delivered if I don't already have a backup on site. And two, you want to be comfortable with the restore process just to make sure you can restore everything back to where you can use that new device if you have to go to a new device. In my case, it was my existing device works fine, but it went through a reset cycle to where I had to restore the actual original device. So this week we got two new ships. The Calico MedTech is one of them. 14,000 supply, 860 USDC. The staff a small but highly skilled rescue queue. Rescue. I can't say it. Rescue crew. Rescue crew. And this ship is sure to be Battlefield favorite. It's a uh, very nice looking. It is a nice looking ship. Yeah, for sure. So a slightly scaled down version of the Calico Evac. Yeah, it does seem it has like a lot it. of stuff, but doesn't have everything. I think it's missing a couple of the uh, the drones and stuff. It's it, what's surprising to me is like so for a medical vessel. Oh, that's right. We think we talked about this before. I was like, why is the tail so thin there? When I think of a medical uh, ship, I think in terms of space to be able to provide life support. But what I think we determined that this was able to do is on that little tail that looked kind of like a dragonfly, that they would actually be able to pick up those pods. So in other words, let's say that you have a ship and your ship is destroyed and you get in your rescue pod and it's just sitting out there floating in space. It looks like this ship has the ability to just go and connect to one of those pods and, uh, and, and carry you away. Interesting yeah. skins on it. Yeah. I'm hoping to see a picture with uh, one of them on it. I think of this. Yeah, there isn't. But they don't say that. Like in the bottom left there, they do show those little squares underneath. Like that's might might be where they connect. But I'm surprised they don't actually show that it's uh, somewhere. Like that's what you would do. And, and in that case, it also seems like it would just be transport. Because once you connect it to one of those pods, it's not like you could get to the person in the pod. You're just picking it up and transporting it. I see this as kind of like a like an ambulance in a way, you know what I mean. Yeah. Whereas the the evac is more like a an actual med vessel, right? Mm-hmm. Bit like a moving field hospital. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the second ship was the Opal Bit Boat. One thousand six hundred supply. One thousand eight hundred. One ten thousand eight hundred. What's the length on that? 
It is uh, 120 meters. Whoa, okay. That's a sizable ship, yeah. It is. Yeah, it's in the 10K range. So. Yeah. It says it like, has uh, the most uh, viewable sp space, so like it's basically all glass you can like see through from the inside, yeah. you know, in almost every direction or whatever. It's it's like almost the most beautiful ship I think I've seen. You start going through these pictures, man. That's and who's the uh, the manufacturer? Oh, cool. so that's Uster. Opal. Okay. And Mot, I believe. So this is the largest Opal we've seen because Opal is the jet yeah. and the jet jet. Yes. And okay. this is a transport. That right there. That's a that. sexy ship. Okay. Yeah, it is. Huh. And it's the, I mean, and it's probably going to be a fast ship because everything else they build, even look at the lines on that, they're all race oriented. Mm -hmm. so this thing will get you point A to point B pretty quick. And it's luxury vessel as well. That's so. an interior? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. It doesn't seem to have a whole, like I was reading, it doesn't seem to have a specific purpose besides like luxury transportation. Is that right? It's just uh, a big fancy? car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, having a couple of these would be useful for sure. Interesting. I want to see if my two for fives can take it out. <laughs> yeah, so 120. 10,000 10, equivalent USD for this ship. It's 120 meters long. But what I don't truly understand is its utility, its transport. So that literally, you're just getting a, per, a group of people point A to point B. Do we know how many people it will hold? So, if I'm going to be a taxi in this thing, how much am I? How many people can I put on here? What's my the minimum, uh, which is six, including a hospitality manager? Yeah. That's the first so, time I've seen that hospitality yeah. manager slot. So, yeah, it's definitely a very uh, posh type of transport vessel. We've seen Let's one other one. Home. Yeah, we we seen one other ship that was transport, or at least it looked like it. The one that looked like the giant mosquito. You know that uh, one, that... Greek Jodastris. Yeah, yeah. Which also looked like a luxury cruise liner vessel. This one looks like it's a little bit smaller than that, but same kind of concept. Which may, leads you to wonder, like, where are you taking these people? That you're going to get a a vessel designed just to luxury transportation. So they want to go somewhere in style. It's probably going to take a while to get there. Where are you? Where are you taking them to? I think I think you just you just target what my issue is with these is because I'm not seeing the short term, and obviously it's all long term, but the, the short term gains from it. Mm -hmm. Whereas like the, the the fighter ships and the and the the, the freight cargo ships like i get that right away like okay right. yeah you're gonna need that out the gate but these luxury cruisers it's like how long how advanced is the game gonna be by the time you start wanting to just go visit another planet you know right if you're in the space limo business right <laughs> but this is 2.5 times more so and it is like upper class 510 meters long this thing is a behemoth yeah interesting which is surprising because that ship right there, you know, that uh, the the asterisk, it is considerably longer than even like the uh, the Guardian. So that's the so capital version, ship. though, right? Yeah. yeah, and they're both and they're both legendary. So that's all legendary up top there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm quite impressed with these ships, even though I probably won't buy them. I think yeah. a lot of people are waiting for like smaller type of things where they can just get a few of them, perhaps instead of breaking the bank because i know a lot of people have already got their mm -hmm. ship they want so uh, yep. yeah you were spot on i'm on i'm on hold i'm not buying any more ships and there's there's two primary reasons why and i'm not going to go into great detail but i've mentioned it on the show before uh the first is is that i don't see star atlas upholding their end to maintain the value of what i'm getting for my ship what was promised is not being delivered yet. So these new ships are going to be for a new audience. So Star Atlas, you need to focus on your marketing because that's who's going to buy these. That's my take. Yeah, that's where I'm at. I'm, I'm pretty much where I'm at as far as like what my, my strategy said I should have in my fleet. And, you know, I've been rounding it out a little bit because I've been catching some deals where stuff is below uh, 
below the the original sell price, which is what you're kind of getting at, Jesse. And so, you know, I've been grabbing a couple of the older ships that I've been wanting for cheap. But mm-hmm. other than that, like I'm not I'm not investing heavily in in more ships at this point. I want to see more meat on the on the table. You know, I mean, let's let's get to the the polis staking. Let's get to the uh, the the land play or or some missions actually being out there, things it's of that nature. Kind of the same thing we're at with uh, Miranda's. You know what I mean? Like, okay, I got what I need to to play the game. If when it comes out, let's uh, let's see the production happen. Exactly. Yeah, I think a lot of projects are going to have this type of lashback because any project out there just cannot evade as fast as people's demands are. <laughs> so with a grain of salt, it's, it takes time. But I understand where you're coming from, Just If something is said, mm-hmm. they need to be held accountable. There needs to be a timeline, and there needs to be updates for yeah. why and they did or did not uh, accomplish that timeline. So I understand all that. So, But I'm talking from the point of either a gamer or an investor, where it's just like, or even both, because I position myself twofold always in projects. The the health of the project as far as the size and w- how many people work for the company. Like these are actual companies that have a lot of people's livelihoods at stake if they just go belly up, right? So what are the odds of that actually happening, even though it's a possibility? Highly unlikely. These are quote unquote blue chip type of projects yeah. that I got involved in. And on the, other, on the other side of that was that I get in with the amount of assets that I would like to own to play with. So I cover all my bases within the game as a gamer. So financially, you choose those solvent, more or less, projects um, uh, or those projects that are going to be around uh, for the long haul with the ups and downs that are just guaranteed to happen, right? So, uh, And then whether they say they're going to do something or not, you just keep up with your investments, just like anything in the traditional world you would do. uh, And and then you could you feel it out as you go because, um, yeah, go ahead, Bon. I think my my perspective is is slightly different than that because it's to me it's not about them not moving fast enough right like i understand how yep. long i mean i've been in the gaming world for a long time and i've waited for games to come out for five years before you know what i mean like that's not a that's not a huge issue to me um to me the issue is the continued selling right like i'm yep. not gonna keep buying into a dream for five years that's not going to happen you know what i'm saying like i will initially invest in a game that i like and i will buy like you were saying the the things that i would want to have in the game in the future but what you're not going to convince me to do is that you're going to keep coming up with sale gimmicks and nfts and this isn't saying that star is doing this necessarily i mean this is something that really is more uh of a holdover from what gala has done where you know every week there's a new nft to sell well, I'm yeah. not going to continue to be buying that. That's not going to happen. You know, let's see the gameplay. And once the gameplay is out, we're playing the game. Now we can start reinvesting some of these returns or, or doing whatever in that level. Yeah, like money is going to move around to wherever the interest is higher, even in the DeFi space outside of gaming. You know, all these protocols like Luna for Anchor Protocol right, to get the 20% on USDT, uh, UST or wherever you go to get an interest. There's, mo- there's money that has been there and it'll stay until it's not lucrative enough. So I, I totally agree with you that, you know, I'm not going to be a continual purchaser of just Star Atlas ships unless it makes sense to um, when we have more clarity and, and information. But um, right. yeah, I think Star Atlas is still positioned to be the um, to be the foundation of of a lot of things happening in the metaverse. I think that their ideas and goals to create this economy and become this kind of like a a tech stack that people can build on and 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 truly get to a place where governance can dictate things later and even vote their development out if need be after they have the runway to kind of create the influence in the in the project they want. I love all of these aspects of it. And that is one of the biggest reasons I'm supporting it. The two places where Star Atlas has let me down is one, I don't find their explanation acceptable for their use of private funding. Like what does that mean for governance when we see Polis and we see Atlas and who's it going to? And that kind of takes away from decentralization to me when you have such a large influence that has the ability to dictate things and we don't know who they are. I, I like anonymity, but as a project, if you're going to give that much power to a group that is unknown rather than disperse that across the board, especially if the people want to pay you to be able to have that. That's one. The second one is where I feel a little bit let down from the project is that it was suggested 
time and time again, one year is your return on investment. That's not where we're at at all. And I don't see them doing anything to correct that. I don't see anything that makes it so that it's not going to be a three-year term, not doing anything to support the uh, Atlas itself by making ship sales in Atlas or doing things to bring that value back up. They've never once done what they suggested they were going to do, which is make corrections to the way that reward systems are paid out. I don't have a reasonable uh, response as to why that hasn't happened. And so for me, that's disappointing. Now that that doesn't set aside all the things they're doing right but those things don't go away just because they're doing other things right. They didn't. They've let me down in those two regards. Like we always do, you know, call it like we see it. You know what I mean? I mean, there's there's nobody has the perfect business model yet because this is all still in the first two years of this whole entire industry. Right. So um, everybody's going to, you know, as they come into this space, is going to be needing to, to make adjustments. As, as they build out in order to both keep the, the player base and the community happy, be successful, and also compete with all these other titans that are coming out to compete with them and take market share. So they're, they're, these are these are exciting times, but they're, I mean, this is a, a very difficult time to be a project manager, you know. So, you know, shout out to the team and everything they're doing, and hopefully they, uh, you know, get some things fixed and keep it moving. Hey, uh, yeah, I have a uh, a photo that I would like to share. I fancy I have, I have it in the in the MVN podcast one. Um, I'll just talk if you're there um, on it. But it's basically a photo of the different networks and the investors that support that network. Hmm. So there's not one particular game that you have these investors backing. It doesn't show any games. It's just the networks. So my point with all this is that um, when we talk about when we talk about these projects and who have invested in them, whether the seed round or like for Star Atlas, we don't know the exact uh, guilds or businesses or investors who have, but do they have the, the interest of the community and the longevity of the project? And Wagner in previous um, interviews would always talk about that's one of the most important things. Uh, in this space and for the game where you have people who are like-minded, have this, share the same morals and values for the success of the project long-term. So if YGG, for example, is one of these who have the most tokens com uh, on uh, from the white papers, it, it would make Wagner sleep well at night knowing that YGG isn't going to go anywhere. They're going to bring users to the game. So there's a trade-off there with maybe how many tokens an investor or a group has versus you know, what the Star Atlas side of things is, are going to be. So there's a lot of worry here, too, uh, across the space of like, you know, we got to get rid of these seed rounds and giving most of the token allocation to these investors. But if there's no players, then you have to what then? And this is an open question for a conversation. It's just you either focus 120% on marketing to, to, to traditional gamers to convince them that NFTs are the way uh, and all of what in court in, uh, encompasses that adventure right to get daily active users or people to invest early on with just a showroom and nothing else or you go from within the space and you get these uh these guilds that become companies in a sense that hoard gamers in a way that understand what the space is becoming and maybe potentially even made money that that's more so after their expenses to live they can afford to invest so I see it both ways. There's pros and cons yeah. to the whole situation, but if it's a YGG or any other like Animoca brands, like if any mm -hmm. one of these projects invest in in a large amount of tokens, would Animoca brand just sell all the tokens once the price went to the all time highs of whatever? You know, you never you never really know, but I, it's, hi it's highly less likely to happen. Here, here's the thing for me: roadmaps shift, trajectory shifts. You adapt and you adjust and you pivot to market conditions. But hold true to the things you said you're going to do from a, an ideology standpoint. If you say that, hey, you know what, what we're building, we believe that a year return on investment is a reasonable thing. And here's some of the things we plan to do. Here's the levers we can pull to kind of hold true to that. And you don't have a reasonable explanation for why you didn't do that. Then to me, you're not being congruent with your word. 
you're not you're not within the realm of integrity, honestly. And so I don't know the reasons for this. And I, I allow space for the fact that there's things that are unknowns that I just am not aware of. But if someone tells me they're going to do something, I expect to hold true to that regardless of market conditions and things like that. And if you can't help me understand why. Right. Mainly to help everyone understand why. And then what's the mm -hmm. new plan? What's the new date? Yeah, if exactly. There was one. Now, right. what do we do from here? Right. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think I think that's I think that's where I'm at on it is be clear. Okay. If hey, you know what? One year is not going to work. It's three years right. now. Okay. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But don't 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 uh not answer the the question Address of the gorilla it. in the room, yeah. right? Because that's the thing that the gala has done continually is uh censor uh the hell out of their community basically to the point where, you know, we, we've seen, you know, we're not the only ones that have seen it now to that point, you know, everybody sees it now, or, you know, the new people coming in don't see it, but n nobody who's been there a year <laughs> is ever going to say that Gala doesn't censor their community. Right? right. And, uh, you know, luckily, you know, Star Atlas doesn't do anything like that. So that's, that's good. But, you know, still, like you say, Jesse, you know, address the issues, meet them head on or say, Hey, you know what? We noticed this, this issue happening. We don't have an answer to it yet, but right. we noticed this, this issue and we just wanted to, you know, let you guys know that we are working on it. We see it and we're, we're, we're moving to address it and we'll get back to you. Exactly. So the team was at Miami this week. Solana, Miami. Yeah. It seemed like a cool event. There were loads of uh, speeches and uh, stuff I'm sure we can find online. Uh, while they were there, there was like a uh, security event that happened. Do we know how many people attend that event? I'm curious what the size as uh, of an event like that is now. Especially in Solana, I mean, g good on them. I mean, they're jumping around. In fact, the next time they do something in here in Europe, uh, like the last one they did in Portugal, I definitely want to go and check that out. Um, but man, it's I I'm curious how the size of events like this are, are growing and how are they promoting it? But do we know what like the attendance was or anything? No idea. Okay. Really. I mean, there's, there's been a lot of stuff going on in Miami though lately. So I wouldn't be surprised if it was quite large. And I think yeah, there was a Bitcoin thing going on at the same time. So there was a lot of crypto people in Miami. What is the security risk here? So at approximately 2.55 p.m. local time, security notified event organizers of a credible security risk to the Solano Miami event. The uh, security risk was detected by a canine during a routine sweep and confirmed by two additional canine units. It's so basically three dogs got together like, this is what we think it is. <laughs> <laughs> I concur, Pooch. I, I concur. concur. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, this was the event like the, the, the team was at, so I just thought I'd bring that up. Yeah, it was shut down early uh, because of whatever was found. And then, you know, so it ends, it was from the 5th of April to the 10th. So it, it was yesterday, I think it was shut down early because of uh, what was found by the canines. So uh, luckily no one was hurt because that would have been all breaking news. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And uh, we also wanted to highlight this song by uh, Moon Man. Yeah, shout out. Yeah, to... so these guys, I think I caught them in a in a space with uh, with uh, dog got it. Uh, yes, Twitter Ashes. With Ashes, uh, Ashes yeah. Twitter space, yeah. yeah. And um, they were talking. They seemed pretty cool, man. They kind of gave me like the Star Wars uh, bounty hunter club vibes. You know what I mean? Job of the Hut type of stuff. So. They seem pretty cool. I actually uh, would love to interact with them when the game goes live. It's a cool community they got going over there. Yeah, I want, I want to hear this, man. What we got playing? Yeah, she's got it. Here and far, lights up like a shooting star. Hit them hard and straight too far. Meet me at the bounty bar. It's easy getting lost in the wrong neighborhood. Deep space asteroids gone for good. You never know what's hiding, what you cannot see. Avoiding two for traps, it's come a man, Santi. Man, I need to pass through your friend's place. If there's a two for scout, could you please help me out? Let me see what I can do, my friend. But if you see a two, find space. Santi! Shoot this bounty through. <laughs> <laughs> yes, bounty was featured. 
Yeah, that was a very cool song. Yeah, interesting stuff, man. So Every time out. I hear one of these, like you guys hear our, our closeouts where we've got Atlas Minor and now we got this Star Atlas contribution, man. I, you guys see behind me here, I'm in the music production, got a lot of stuff there on the shelves. I'm almost feeling called out to like show up and create our own version <laughs> for Rome or for Metaverse Nomad. Man. <laughs> Keep it coming, man. You, you guys find more stuff like this? I, yeah, I love it. I we'll, all make all. A verse. we'll all make a verse for a song. That's it. Put our two, two gway into whatever. <laughs> <laughs> two way i like it uh, yeah that's pretty much it for star atlas this week right on right on so Sweet. uh there's gonna be a mirandus ama this week yes go uh, finally tomorrow, i believe yeah, I dropped a couple questions in for this here, so I'm curious to see. And by the way, I mean, you know, it, it is nice to see that for for a project that you know has been delayed, and we have our own questions about where it's going and and what they're up to over there. A lot of unknowns. Uh, they seem to be at least putting some things forward now, and I'm curious. I'm going to be on this. I want to see how it's going to go. So, yeah, and they I'm, have uh, a form. Shout out to Michael Wag or not Michael Wag. <laughs> uh, Shout out to uh 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 what's his name? McCarthy. Oh, yeah. McCarthy. <laughs> Goodness, girl, I'm terrible you had me names draw a blank too. <laughs> Got you back. My, I'm not pulling names today, but yeah, shout out to Mike McCarthy for for doing this. This was something that was promised to us by Bid Bender way back in the day that we would have these AMAs and stuff on a regular basis, and they obviously fell off for quite a while. And uh, I'm just happy to see him bringing it back. One of our uh, guild mates, shout out to Observer has been really yeah. active in, in keeping all of us who haven't been in the Gala get, uh, Discord as much lately, uh, keeping all of us abreast of what's going on. And Mike McCarthy's been sitting there uh, popping in the Discord, communicating, shooting ideas out. And it's been a lot of fun. I've, I've had an opportunity to, to interact with him a couple of times, and it's been real cool. So, you know, shout out to the team for, for getting Miranda's back on track. I'm excited to see it. I give him two months of doing it consistently, and then I'll get cook up. Congratulations. <laughs> Without a sale. <laughs> Without a sale. No, no, I don't know, bro. I'm not throwing shade. I'm just saying. And I know oh there's a project God. that you might be thinking of who's watching right now who you have issues with because of lack of transparency, no white paper, or something of the sort. Okay? Token token price, economics. Just pick one. There's one out there. So you can obviously relate to what we're talking about. And if you're invested in Gala, we're not trying to FUD any of your bags because we have bags. So all I'm saying is that we enjoy the community because we have a, a big stake in the project as far as investing, but then we also want to play the game because we like and, the genre. So we're all on the same page here. We've been waiting for over a year to, to understand how the sausage is made, so there must be a lot of ingredients <laughs> in this sausage. That's a long <laughs> sausage. A lot of artificial preservatives and uh, <laughs> no, but uh, uh, you, you, you triggered me. You triggered me, Jesse. You triggered me because this would this would turn out terrible if they turn around and do a, another NFT sale on this right? on the hey, back of this well, AMA. I'm not gonna be happy. I'm ready for it? What are they what selling you, tomorrow? Oh my god! What do you think do about the, uh, the a second episode of uh, Rome's uh, Bingo Night for Mirandus? We can maybe throw something together for tomorrow. And we'll see what words are used and, uh, you know, rekindle that, that bingo, a game that we had that kind of uh, took hold of yeah. McCarthy's yeah, mind. Interesting. Yeah. You know, that's a, that's a cool thing because it's, it's actually kind of like a, a part of Gala history now, right? The, the Miranda's bingo that we created. And the idea was is that, you know, because they were going to be doing these AMAs all the time and we could, you know, keep this game going and then the AMAs died. So hopefully... They, they do consistently do these AMAs again, so we can go back to having that fun. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. So And supposedly, like, uh, by the way, believe it or not, we're in Q2 of 2022 now already. So uh, Gala, and maybe we'll get an update on it tomorrow, but they're supposed to have another play test this quarter, which means that somewhere within the, uh, the remaining 80 days of Q2, there should be another Miranda's play test, of which – you can continue to earn a bit more of that material. Now, we don't know if it's going to be the same objective or how they will manage it, but my guess is is it's not going to be easily managed, so it's probably going to get back to the factor of if you log in, because honestly, that's all I did. Logged in, and I got the checks for everything. I was like, whew, 
that saves me a bunch of time. So it'll probably be something similar, but we don't yet know. But there is supposed to be a play test within Q2 where you can earn some more materium for each of the uh, exemplar avatars that you have in your wallet. Not to raise the bar too high, but I actually have some hopes on this because in the Discord they were talking about wanting to see a lot of arrows flying at some kind of gobbler or something. So hopefully, I mean, I would okay. love to sit up there and, and be shooting a bunch of stuff. I'd, I'd have a right. ball. So hopefully that's what we got going on. We'll see. You know, Injury and combat, I think, yeah, it's probably going to be centered around that a bit. You know what I think would, again, one of the things we do on the show a lot is like theory crafting. And, and that's why I think that if, if, if Gala Games wasn't so fearful of, of actually just having someone on our show and, and, and just being open, that we would love to just do some brainstorming with them, thinking in terms of like, what could you do to seed the Mirandus economy? Because at the end of the day, a world like that still is probably one of the most appealing to me, honestly, even above space. Uh, I would love to have that thing where you could be a blacksmith and hammer out some things or be a herbalist going out and gather stuff and you can contribute to the economy the way you've seen it in past MMORPGs. So if they actually had a way for like even tests on the server to start doing some crafting and that crafting could result in, uh, I guess now materium, which is a little strange to me. But it would be cool if you could actually start that process of crafting some things that actually produce some NFTs. Well, that yeah. was the original promise was there was going to be that mini game where we would be able yeah. to basically seed the economy by crafting yep. and stuff like that. And it never happened. So I don't know if that's, you know, once again, back to lack of roadmaps. Right. I don't know if that's still on the table or not you know, because we haven't heard. So that's actually probably a good question. If somebody wants to hit that link and throw it in that AMA, uh, you know, win mini game or is it off the table, you know? So yeah, on the screen right now, this is the price of Materium. It's kind of been spiking recently. Mm -hmm. And it's fascinating when I see this because for me, when Materium first came out, the first night I missed it uh, because I already had a goal I was going to sell immediately. It came out the gate around a buck. I didn't get to it till around 60 cents. Dropped all the way down to the 30s. Now it's back up around 80 cents. And you think about like, what is the driving force behind this? So you do have a community over that definitely supports this project. There's one thing that you can purchase with your Materium right now, and that's lamps. Those lamps went for 10,000 Materium originally, jumped up to 20,000, I believe. Now they're up over 50,000 Materium. We don't know what that means in the grand scheme of the rest of the economy in the game. So we don't know if that's overpriced, underpriced. We don't know the utility of a lamp, but it's fascinating to see how Gala is able to take any of their tokens like this without anyone really knowing what it does, what it's about, how stable is the current supply, and still have something that grows in value like this it just my mind is constantly blown when i see things their like tokens that. do do well consistently yeah. you're right yeah. on that um one thing that i could say is that they do have a particularly um no disrespect to anybody out there because i'm a i'm a fan as well but they do have a particularly fanboyish community in, in the Gala Games ecosystem. There's totally. a lot of people who believe very strongly in Gala. And uh, like I've mentioned before, sure. I mean, if, you were, if you've were if you been in Gala for a long time, you've made money. We all have. And so that money is, you know, a lot of those guys are pretty liquid. Some of them are professional gamers, I've heard now. You know what I mean? And some people are living off their notes. So there's a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, money in the community they can flow back into these things. So I think some of it at least is going to be a bit of that, you know, cause like I mentioned, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I'm, I bought a little bit of material. I, I kind of want to buy a little bit more. I just been focused on other things, but I kind of want to have a nice little bag of material when the game launches, you know? Cause one of the questions that I asked, and I think we already have an answer, but I was questioning is material, the end all be all coin within the game? Because, one of the things we've heard McCarthy say time and time again, going back to, I can almost quote him almost exactly, is that he likes the concept of having, you know, your your copper, silver, gold, platinum model that you see in, in traditional Dungeons and Dragons type rule set games, or at least uh, MMOs that follow that model. He said it Even, again recently. 
Yeah. yeah. And, and even references, you know, like a, a amazing book, you know, uh, um, name of the wind that talks about copper jots. So that makes sense. And the thing that when I first heard about Materium that appealed to me is I thought, wouldn't it be cool if in addition to the traditional money system, they had another token that represented magical energy. So that's how I see Materium being used. And I think it would be amazing if you you have some Materium that you need to spend or utilize for creating a potion or to enchant some armor or to cast this really difficult spell or something like that. But I don't think that that should literally be the name of the money used for other things you're doing in the game. So one of my questions was, is this going to now be the definitive token within Mirandus? Or is it just going to be a token within the makeup of, of the economy? Uh, that's that's my question. I think it would be amazing if they kept it separate for things that were magic, but then had a traditional money system. The way he talks, you know, I don't think he even knows yet. You know, right. I mean, so that's that's key. But you just had me thinking about, like, preparing for wild WoW raids back in the day and having right. to get all your resources together. Just a minute, you had to buy a bunch of material before the raid. Yeah. Like, oh, I'm almost out of material. I gotta, <laughs> I gotta go. I gotta you go real quick, man. Yeah. <laughs> I get you back after this raid. <laughs> yeah, I think McCarthy isn't taking full advantage of the community that has been existing this whole time, other than just what he's recently been doing, which is having conversations in the Discord. So, yeah, definitely yeah. would uh, invite him onto the show anytime and hey tomorrow that could be one of the questions when will you come on the, the podcast and uh yeah. and, and theory craft <laughs> with us die hard supporters because although we talk in a way economically of the game uh or the the company right uh, financially and how they raise their money by selling nfts that doesn't mean mirandis or mccarthy aren't capable um building out or mccarthy is not capable of building out this game that we all imagine can be from previous titles and then what we're going into with the web three stuff to be a success. So uh, I want them to win. I want to see it work. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and like we've done in the past, we don't, we don't do uh we don't try to trap anybody. You know what I mean? So, you know, you yeah. watched our interviews with people in the past. We, we give them questions beforehand and you know, we let them make stuff out or whatever, you know, so I, no we deal. actually got, we got this really flaming comment. It was actually, I don't think it posted to the YouTube channel, but it was this dude that's, that's been following us for a while. And he starts off saying, I really used to respect you guys. And then you guys did this interview with Michael Wagner. And it was just like, it was this pre-recorded thing. And it's like, dude, we, he, he, he knew none of the questions we were going to ask. And I, we could have shown up and we could have blasted him and we could have, but, but what's the point of that? We had questions that were positive and questions that were challenging and it was establishing a relationship with a company that we're a part of that we want to see succeed. Doesn't mean that we don't have tougher questions, but if you just show up at something like that and you all, you're just like, where were you on the night of July 25th? And you're just going to like, just light them up and put them on the defense. You're not, you're not going to get, you're not, you're not going to establish a relationship and get the questions answered that you want long-term. Right. So it's the same thing. Think, so I think McCarthy people would show up, same thing would happen. We would be respectful and we would be like, Hey, let's figure out some stuff together. Let's brainstorm. Let's ask some, ask some good questions. I think people misunderstand the difference between, you know, when you're, you're, you're speaking of your own opinions and stuff like that. And when you're creating a space for a conversation, right? Like exactly. you don't, you don't go into like, you look at like the reason that Joe Rogan so as successful as he is, is because he creates a comfortable space for a person to open up. And you don't, you don't do that by trying to be a, uh, what are those journalists that try to do the gotcha questions all the time? And then they end right. up getting, they get blacklisted where they can't get into the party. You know what I mean? Like, why would you want to do that? I mean, obviously when we do our normal show, we're going to, we're going to sit there and we're going to talk about all the things that we worry about, about a project, but we're not going to sit there and beat a guy up. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? When he's, you know, sitting over here trying to give us alpha and stuff like that. Just let it happen. I saw that recently with somebody, some celebrity that was getting interviewed about over this Will Smith stuff. And he clearly had some questions. He said he didn't want to be asked and they refined the whole interview. And then all of a sudden they're like, let me slide this in. And then you heard a third <laughs> voice come into the interview for the first time, which was clearly their over. publicist. That's all the time we have. Thank you. That's all we've got. Yeah. <laughs> got to shoot your shot sometimes. You never know. <laughs> you'll, you'll get a, a higher position. 
You're like, this guy takes chances. He takes risks. We want him on our right. team. So if you see anyone in the, in the community of uh, the Miranda's discussion channel and their, and their official Discord server, and they seem to be questioning and, and, and savvy and, and talking about the words investment and return on or anything, <laughs> just you know give a shout out because we're always uh, taking on new members for, the, for our guild, for uh, Miranda specifically, outside of uh, Star Atlas. And um, yeah, it's a to be continued journey with all of these projects. I mean, shout out to to Fancy Head of Rome. I mean, that's how he brought us all together in the first place, right? He picked us out. We were the ones that were that were up big in the in the Discord and Gala, you know, talking that stuff and asking those hard questions and and pushing back and and he caught us and brought us together. Indeed. Yep. Thanks, guys. Yeah. So this week, uh, the co-founders Grant and Kieran they did their one v one in Alluvium for a million in unlock. No, locked ILB. And uh, yeah, they really broke down the gameplay in a way they haven't done before, which I thought was quite interesting. So uh, we're going to listen to an excerpt from that. Over systems and to show everyone details. So, yeah. Aaron, this is what everybody's starting at looking at when they, when they jump into uh, the battle board and our interface here in survival mode. What, yep. are, what should be a player's first considerations when you arrive so, on the battle board and you're thinking about your strategy? In, in the private beta, because no one owns any particular uh, shards, we're actually giving people a randomized uh, deck. In the full game, you'll have to actually make the deck uh, that suits your needs. Uh, there's a lot of characters in the game, but you only get to take in a deck of approximately 30 cards. Uh, that's little Flair there, <laughs> and uh, Len, she's uh, looking great. Flair's looking a little bit cute. Um, the the point at the start would be to organize your deck and look at who you're up against. the The main purpose of survival mode for us is to give players a PVE experience, so they're not playing against another person. It's a little bit more casual, and it's a little bit more just about learning the systems and trying to really theory craft right so at the bottom you'll see you've got all of your shards as as i said in private beta they're going to be randomized underneath them you've got your controls to filter through your different uh, shards so that it can make it a little bit easier to find what you need if you click on water for example anything that has at least the the primary uh, affinity of water will be in there if you if you click on two of them, it'll show you, uh, you know, like the combination ones. Yeah, I've got uh, water and earth going simultaneously. So yeah. if you're yep. looking to combine multiple affinities into mm -hmm. one, maybe to make to find some sort of composite, for example, exactly. you can click multiple at the same time to do that. For example, if we clicked water and fire, that would help yep. us find steam, right? Yeah, exactly right. So mm -hmm. it'll show you water, fire, and steam when when you have that. And then you could filter out further by clicking on the three dots underneath there, which represents the stage. And that would only bring up the things that match those, but are stage three. Stage three is obviously the highest level that our characters can get to. It's their final fusion. Uh, the way that our game works is uh, in the overworld, you'll capture the alluvials. And if you have five, uh, sorry, three of the same alluvial, you'll be able to fuse them together to make the next stage. If you get three of that stage two, you'll be able to fuse them together to get a stage three, which is like their, their final form. The, there's a few little intricacies with that that I'm not going to go into today. We, we want there to be a few surprises for the player base, but that's a basic understanding of how you should select your deck. And just remember, when you go into survival mode, once we're out of the beta, the point is that you'll have to create your own deck and it'll have your own flair to it. So you'll, you might choose a deck that's very much water-based or very much scion-based. It's totally up to you. Um, the, that's that's little uh, uh, Scarabug there, um, absolute cutie. Um, the point of all of these yeah Man. that was a uh, very informative that was like a three minute excerpt from an hour video and uh yeah they paid off for a million i would say that to me at least from when i look across the landscape of projects being developed that 
Alluvium is is leading the way in what a triple A game development can look like. Um, yeah, all from the start, and especially because we feel like we've been a part of the journey as we saw the 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 artwork, and then now seeing this modeling of in in game play, it's really impressive to have watched their journey. I agree. Yeah, I want to get my hands on it, and it looks yeah. like it's really close. Mm -hmm. it looks good. Yep. And then the land sale, that's going to be a big seller. Yeah, big I agree. They got a lot coming in the next couple of months, and that's all going to go back in towards the IOV ecosystem. So uh, we, uh, that'll be the thing. Will, will land be sold in IOV? Yeah, and if I'm, I might be wrong, but I believe it might burn the tokens that are used, so it reduces supply. Dude, that's I love the tokenomics of ILV. I just really do. I've been pleased with it. I agree. So yeah, Ray, uh, Sean, take the reins. Sure. Yeah, I got some tabs that I just wanted to run through. Some of these games that uh, I'm interested in, that I'm involved in, and looking forward to. Aside from you know Axie Infinity, which will just have two tabs on for now. Uh, let me just share my screen and. If the connection gods will be in my corner today, <laughs> then we will have uh, a smooth going here. But yeah, just first up, the, the raise of 150 million within a week from uh, one of the founders, uh, Psychout, was pretty promising. And we have all of these guys here. Uh, let me just share my screen. Uh, and we can do one of these. Um, yeah, so some key points here to take away just very briefly uh the announcement of the 150 funding led by binance but participation also from animoca a16 dialectic and uh, uh paradigm so uh the round combined sky mavis balance sheets funds uh with the use to ensure that all users affected by the ronin chain will be re reimbursed uh the ronin network bridge will open once there's uh, once it has undergone a security upgrade and several audits which can take several weeks and then SkyMary is in the process of impl implementing vigorous internal security measures to prevent further attacks. So like we touched, we talked about it earlier in the, in, and then there's a whole bunch of information here uh, that you can get into if you are invested in one no more and you didn't know that this was the Substack. stack. Um, but again, right. this was a fundraise. It's not a charitable donation. Those, those right, uh, right. contributing funds have expectations. Right. So whether they were tokens uh, or equity in the company, uh, yet to be known. I th I'm not if I if I don't know, then please correct me out there if you don't. Um, but yeah, there's always a, a give and take, and uh, we'll see uh, what happens in the next two years. Uh, but yeah, moving on from that. So Phil La is the lead for the land development uh, of the game, and if you go to his particular, if you go to his Twitch, uh, his Twitter, sorry, he gives up he gives up a lot of uh, conversation about the game and he's looking forward to uh to the uh development of it and the, the help of the community uh, when mm -hmm. it comes to that so just to you know asking community what they want to see and giving us updates on what's going to happen because it's been many years since the land uh the last demo uh and then we have here just uh he went through 500 survey responses from the feedback of origin 3 of uh, e3 that was launched uh and if you haven't tried it out i just because we're in this space and we should just be able to play games that are free, that doesn't have a paywall, just to experience and get a feel for the the wider uh, space uh, of what's going on around you. So this genre might not mean anything to you, the company, whether they did right or wrong by you or the community. None of this should matter. It's just this is what's happening, whether you like it or not. And this is just my philosophy on the space. On the space. Uh, so I just try to get involved in anything. Try it if it's free. Uh, get involved, and if I, and if the more research I do, I just, you know, I, I jump in to see if the future is bright as far as it, it being an investment. But yeah, uh, so there's all these lists of things that from uh, the game being out and able to play already that are going to be changing soon. So this is going to be an ongoing thing uh, as the game is live, and uh, I think it's tomorrow, right? So this was the uh, the announcement that they had. So you're going to have free starter axes, a new card. New cards and power-ups, faster, more skill-based gameplay, and beautiful new art and animations. And I won't show you any of the art. Uh, I kind of do that regularly. But um, yeah, once you get in, whether you have access or not, there's a great 
adventure mode storyline that walks you through how to do everything. It's a very detailed uh, and fun experience, I'd say, reminiscent of Pokemon and other games that you might have played before, the the usual. Um, and then on Monday, we have a AMA with the with uh, with uh, Phil La, and uh, he's going to talk about land specifically. So this is going to be one of the AMAs, the first AMA that we had live for anything land play and uh, related. So I look forward to that. Um, and uh, yeah, if you're interested in that, there'll be an announcement in our Discord ourselves and also in the Axie Infinity ones. Check them out on Twitter. And um, yep, Origin is live. But moving on from Origin, come on, connection gods. Right, so this is what I was talking about. Out of order as far as tabs, but um, on the 11th, the game pr product lead, we're going to have uh, updates on land. So that's going to be at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on their Twitch. So you can check that out. Learn more about land if you have any. <laughs> or are interested in getting involved. But yeah, there's another game that I'm particularly fond of. And it's uh, Heroes of Mavia. So fancy if you want to queue that video up. They came out with a, with a trailer. Uh, a gameplay trailer. Not a gameplay trailer, sorry. A just game trailer. And we're going to play it here for you now. So, thanks for that fancy. But yeah, so this game in particular is what I call the Clash of Clans of Web3 NFT gaming. <laughs> so they're literally building out that particular game, but in Web3. So if uh, let me reshare my screen here. And if you join their Discord they'll in their uh, Sneaks Peaks channel, which is public, you're able to see uh, constant updates on what they're doing and how it's all going to look. They're going to have a, a player. So there's a video on their YouTube channel as well that kind of goes and walks through their white paper and explains everything about the economics of the project. There's going to be two tokens, Ruby and Mavia token, um, utility and governance token, similar to what we know in the space. And it's going to be literally Clash of Clan gameplay. So you can buy your NFT land and you could do a soft staking of the land and earn a in-game item, which is going to help you um, increase your luck uh, when it comes to earning more Ruby tokens, which is going to be the SLP equivalent. Um, so, yeah, definitely check them out. This is a project that I've gotten land on the secondary market. And, yep, it's looking promising. And they give constant updates. And they have uh, community members vote on what they would like the art to look like. They'll give you four options. And you could choose the emotes. So um, if you ever play Clash of Clans, this is a no-brainer for me. Uh, What's the size of their community now? <clears throat> I think it's a whopping 68,000. Okay. All right. So, uh, yeah. And major invest investment backing, as we know in the space for games that are sought after or, I guess, um, betted on to be game changers in the space. And it says their total land, 8,000. That's how many plots they've got for sale? Yeah, so 8,000, 10,000 is the total, but 2,000 were held back and okay. for either giveaways. and um, But they're soon going to be released and for a land sale. So on OpenSea, you might see 10,000 already. Okay. They, have a, they had an announcement saying that they don't want it to incrementally go up. Um, so it makes it seem like the, the total is being diluted for people who don't know what's going on. And then make the project look like they're just selling land infinitely, not knowing that 10, 10K is the cap. Um, so yeah, it's been a, it's been some time they were 
they were getting this trailer together. Is there any understanding of the 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 economics within the game? Because from on the surface, without knowing too much, and I actually I wasn't a, a Clash of Clans player, but just based on what I've seen thus far, it looks like they've done a really good job of modeling the fun to play side of it. So how do you how do you uh, see the the play to earn weaving into that? And do you think they'll do well with it? I, I, obviously, you own land, so you're confident, uh, you're bullish on the project. But um, how do you see that weaving in? Do you feel like they have a pretty good strategy for the play-to-earn side? Yeah, I, I do. It, it's been a while since I touched up on the tokenomics exactly, but what was had me bullish in the beginning, uh, which was not so long ago, which is, again, the video I'd suggest everyone watching on their YouTube channel, uh, which walks through exactly how the tokenomics work, is that you're going to be able to play and rent you could okay, of course you're going to be able to rent your land out and do the split and if you have any experience in clash of clans via your google account you can um transfer that over to not gain any advantage in in uh, heroes of mavia but it would show the reputation of you playing in clash of clans so you would be i guess uh, a person to consider as a guild member and uh, then someone who just doesn't have any reputation from an outside game like Clash of Clans. Uh, so I thought that was pretty neat. And it's all going to be in-house. But as far as the tokenomics are concerned, when you win, you earn a ruby. right? And you're going to be able to buy heroes uh, with the ruby, uh, which is going to help you defend your land. So if you're, not, if you're AFK away from your computer or your, or your phone, and, you get, and your land gets attacked, as we know in... Um, in Clash of Clans, it happens all the time, and you come in, you have to uh, use your oil uh, and your and your gold to replenish your weapons and your walls. If you successfully defended, you will earn ruby, and that's going to be a constant, ongoing thing. So I see it being a fruitful economy as far as what you're buying with ruby from earning it, from attacking, and then also defending, and then uh, using those funds to either cash out. And um, so... Yeah, I'm. I'm not the the expert on the tokenomics, in the sense, uh, I guess to explain it exactly the way that I heard it, which gave me the confidence. It's a it's a great loop that is um, that's stronger than other projects that I've seen when I've heard them talk about it on YouTube channel AMAs or via reading it in the white paper. Yeah, the aesthetics of gameplay look stellar. Uh, looks pretty cool. Yeah, so this is something on the radar that I kind of wanted to touch touch on in the show because um it's uh, it's coming so this year they're going to have the the closed beta if you have a land you'll be able to play and then they're going to slowly open that up and um for the masses and um yeah so onwards to nifty island so nifty island is a another project that i've been involved in for a while now and they're interesting in the sense that the land is scarce and that, and, and what I mean by that is that you'll have an island for free. Right? You don't have to buy anything with land. The only NFTs that they ever had and given away were the palms, so palm tree uh, NFTs, the pistols that were uh, generated and given away for those to mint who own the palm, and then the blades. Uh, so there's actual uh, an actual sword, um, which you can probably see here, the Ultra Blade drop. So all of these were dropped or claimed from being in the community and take and and either being a strong community member or part, taking part in challenges. And uh, what the what's interesting about this is that the island token, which hasn't come out yet, will be earned by how much foot traffic you bring onto your island. So this has gonna is I'm seeing it having mass appeal to a lot of projects. Snoop Dogg could be one of them, right? Where you'll be able to Minecraft style build your your island. And let me show you here. There's like a, a neat little um, video that I had that community members have already uh, started building on uh, with their early access. So it goes pretty fast, but you could walk through and there's a photo up on the top left of what was built in the game and what it what was meant to be. So... Here we have like a Super Smash Brothers, uh, <laughs> one of the maps for Super Smash Brothers, and uh, I'm not sure, but my uh, my wife told me she knew that one. <laughs> that was Man. a Thin Man back there. Yeah, <laughs> and then we have the uh, Death Star, 
of people's uh, mock-ups of what it was. And here we have like a uh, plant versus zombies. And this is the Mario Kart, the infamous one that we all know and love. And then, uh, yeah, the Mario Kart 64, I believe. And this, I think I said that was Monster Hunter. And then we have a Pac-Man map. Simple Minecraft. So let me get out of here. And yeah, so it's a project that's continually being uh, built on. The newest patch that um, that happened just the other day is uh, <laughs> it was interesting because it kind of gave me Miranda's vibes. This looks almost exactly as Miranda's, and if it's on Unity, then I guess that's the that might be the reason. I was kind of uh, confused. So these are all going to be items that you're able to use in the inventory that's given to you to build with. They have color blocks. They have stairs. They have uh, roofs. They have poles. They have lamps. They have beds. Right. So if you, um, right. So you'll have your island, and you can develop it to be whatever you want it to be. Uh, they're going to keep growing. So custom island skins that you can import NPCs. Uh, to keep you company, like maybe a bear or a deer, maybe because there wasn't any animals prior to this patch, and much more. Um, yeah, it's it's a I would say a underrated type of project, even though it's it's a uh, gaining a lot of traction in uh in in different spaces of uh, Web three gaming because it's not net technically a game. They will have games. So I was uh, recently on a stream with Joe, one of the founders, and one of the community mods. And we were just a build and chill session, and it was pretty pretty interesting as I've been in the community for a while, and um, I just see it working, uh, and and it brings up this argument of where why is everyone buying scarce plots of land in the metaverse when it should be infinite, right? Why not have infinite amount of land where anyone could just start in uh, getting involved and then benefiting in a different way than buying it and maybe staking it or flipping it because uh, now it encourages people who are interested in seeing the potential in that way to, to hang around and develop uh, their island to be a success like an actual business right you see a, a vacant corner store and you want to open up a business like you have to put in some work <laughs> yeah you have to I guess pay rent but uh, you wouldn't have to do this here <laughs> so there was a community member shout out to DBoss who built the first Axie Infinity um, with color blocks on my island, you could give permissions to, for people to help build. And what's interesting, you could also put up your NFTs um, and shop, not via the game yet, but they've, uh, they're have they going to onboard Solana uh, wallet addresses as, as well as maybe Polygon uh, NFTs. So you're going to be able to build uh, more or less whatever you want. And it could be museums of your NFTs. It's pretty interesting and it's fun because you can have meetings with your friends again you can have your mic on you can be running around there's a lot of uh, jumping uh type of uh, obstacle courses that people make so you know the sky's the limit with what i think this game is going to be uh and i call it a game because they will have games this is just building out the whole infrastructure but it's more tending towards uh, builders and artists uh, at the at the moment so uh i've played it in our in our rome discord once or twice and i uh, shared my screen, so let me know if you guys are more interest or interested, uh, and I'll show you what the game looks like, or maybe on another day. But yeah, check out their Twitter. It always goes a long way going there. And here's their roadmap. You could, roadmap, you could check them out. Um, and here we have a 3D party avatar support. All right. So earlier I was talking about how if you own NFTs, you're going to be able to use those NFTs in different games and and use them as your avatar. So I think that's the most in one of the most interesting things, other than just having a token, buying or not selling land, uh, as we all are used to in the space. Uh, they'll have a social web app launch. Uh, they're going to have, uh, yeah, and then play to earn, essentially. Uh, that's last. And I like the fact that they're not having a token right away. A lot of these NFT gaming companies or projects, they don't necessarily need a token right away. They could build a game that's fun and appeal to NFT crypto game people right or involved in, in that, that are involved in the space but it's not necessary so much anymore it was more of a trend that everybody i think was getting on board with and they could always implement tokenomics that are 
fleshed out and thought through at some point after the game is already playable and fun, which should be the main focus um, with a lot of these games. But that's just my opinion. Uh, but yeah, on to the next project that I'm interested in and also invested in is the uh, Geno Pets. So aside from Stepping, uh, Stepping, which is another walk to earn genre game, there's Geno Pets. So um, I particularly like uh, fell uh, fell in love with it. I must I must say, and uh, you're able to have five crystals, mint a habitat. If you own a Geno pet, you're ahead of the game as far as the leveling up of that Geno pet. And um, there's a whole working with tokenomics going on in that. You can check out the white paper. We're not going too detailed here, but last but not least is DeFi Kingdoms, which is one of my all-time faves as far as uh, what they're building and the team and uh, how transparent, similar to Star Atlas, like we talk about. It's one of the, the more f uh, favorable projects on my list. And... Um, yeah, they just had their expansion on Crystal Veil, which is on the Avalanche subnet uh, from their previous, which still exists, Serendale, which lives on ha Harmony. And uh, they just had an AMA recently, which you can check out. Also, they have a YouTube channel that try to get involved with different platforms. Um, right. <laughs> Thank you, Knet. Not financial advice. I could hear your wallets opening now to just spend your money on all of these <laughs> NFT projects that are selling uh, <laughs> NFTs. So, yeah, they're going to have pets as well. I uh, recently, I just need one more for my collection. So I've been at this game for a while now. I introduced it to the community of Rome on this podcast, I think, a couple of weeks ago or so. And I wasn't involved then, but that was before, I guess, the, the run-up of the Jewel token, which is their uh, power token. Not necessarily a governance token, but yes, they only have one token. Uh, all assets or items in the game are NFTs or they have tokens, uh, addresses related to them. So you can quest your heroes. There'll be pets coming up soon. You can check out the roadmap. Um, also their YouTube channel, like I said, the AMA, very informative. Uh, and you're going to have some gameplay, a 3v3 with your, uh, you could have, yeah, you could have priests. You could have um, the, the the usual DPS in the, in the mid or in the back. You have your wizards and your... Um, Whoever's going to be in the front as I'm drawing a blank on the tank. There you go. So, yeah, that's my Twitter. You could always follow me there if you want. And I'm just sharing stuff. But, yeah, definitely check out Sandwich Punch. He uh, updates what happens on these AMAs. A great source of information. Uh, this was April 4th with just the overview of what happened on the AMA. So if you don't want to listen to a two-hour video and you just want to read through, this is a uh, document. I would suggest. So great art, great community, great team, very transparent. Tokenomics are sound. They're growing and expanding onto different chains. And it's all based off of decentralized finance. So the game is being developed. Um, and it's uh, it's pretty cool. But that's all for me. What was Definitely. the release within the past week? Something that they added to it that you were waiting for? Oh, that was the, uh, the expansion onto uh, Avalanche which has already happened and your heroes that you sent off on the perilous journey was if they came back, you get rewards, uh, you get crystal airdrop and everything was an anticipation of the crystal uh, liquidity pools. So, or the jewel liquidity pools or in the liquidity pools in general. Uh, so they're very high APRs. You know, I, I hear a lot of people talking about in different air, different communities about how it's all a Ponzi scheme. All of these games are Ponzi schemes. The tokenomics, it's all a joke because once it's not lucrative, people are going to get out. But that's the whole point of learning more about these projects, not so much just the tokenomics. Because if the game is going to be built out to be fun, then sure, the, the, the token might not be all-time high all the time. But there's going to be a, a more, more or less a steady price for these tokens, which are governance tokens. So if you set yourself up to earn it in some way or stake it in some way, I guess you can build from that financially, but these games I feel are going to be fun as I continue to watch development. When I think in terms of Ponzi, it's more along the lines of hot potato, meaning like, okay, if you could take a project and you can say, okay, today doesn't grow anymore. The community doesn't grow any further. How long does the project sustain from here? Meaning like, do people continue to play because it's fun to play? 
do people continue to earn because there's a mechanism that makes the existing players want to continue to contribute in the game for the money that's also coming out? Or is it fully dependent upon new players coming in? Because that's honestly how a Ponzi is defined, is any right. economic structure that depends on new life constantly coming in. Otherwise, the whole system collapses. Sure. Yeah. And I key. feel less likely that the projects I've shown are that. But in mm -hmm. a sense, you any game needs daily active users, whether they're crypto related or not. Yeah, you know, for it to be success in, in the in the eyes of I guess what we think is success when it came to how popular your game is, right? Because there could be there are fun games out there that no one's really playing. You know, they're being they're still being developed and continued to to grow in some way. But how do you look get that mass appeal? You know, the financial side is one way, but if the game is fun, I guess you know we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's that's the key. Um, you know, what you're hitting at, Jesse, there is, you know, the play to earn model is still up in the air. There mm -hmm. is not a successful play to earn game yet. There are games that have had very much success, but there isn't one that you could say is its own standalone economy. Therefore, none of them are successful because all of them require constant new users thus they are all ponzi's up until this point so you know we're waiting we're waiting for that invention it's i feel like it's around the corner i think all of yeah. us do that's why we're here right but um it's not there yet um but i think uh, going back to what something you were mentioning earlier is you got to have that coming together of certain forces you got to have the good gameplay and you got to have the solid economic model and that's what's going to create this fictional economy in the metaverse that's going to be able to maintain itself. And so, you know, we're, we're looking for it All out here, you know, roaming the metaverse. We're looking for it. And I think we're going to find one eventually. One of the things that I always thought was cool in some of the, you know, whether it was Warcraft or some of the other MMORPGs like that is when you started to take notice of someone that was crafting the same stuff. Like if you were buying leather goods or buying potions, like, man, this person devotes a lot of time. I'm think I personally think it's going to be a cool day where you ask somebody what they do and like, no, I'm just, I, I like fish for rare fish on this one particular river in this one metaverse game. <laughs> and the dude is actually able to have fun doing it and creates enough value that people need his goods and services. And that's an interesting contribution on his part. And, and that the is, oh, go ahead, a stable economy will allow that if it's done right. Yeah, I mean, the fact of the matter is, I think we've all engaged in this matter um, in the past, right? We've we've all played games where we were rich for whatever reason, because we found something or we were engaged in something. Or um, I used to play markets in, in uh, World of Warcraft where I'd buy up a, a good that was cheap and can corner the market on it, you know what I mean, and make money that way. I mean, there's all these things you could do. Yeah in these games right arbitrage right so that's that's something that is coming but you know the 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 ground or the floor has to be built first you know right and, and that's you know what i think it would be amazing if there was like some think tanks that actually thought about that and and actually have game um uh, the economy group within a game take a group of people and start thinking this stuff through. And that's the part that I wish honestly was more transparent. And I don't know that enough games are out there that have thought that part through. It seems like they're doing it more in a bubble where it would be great to witness a project like that, that was more open source where they were asking more people what they thought makes good for good gameplay. What type of tweaks and adjustments, how do you guys feel about this as a part of an economy? How much weight should this have versus this other thing? That's the piece that I'm waiting to see because right now, so much of what these economies are being, so many of the economies for these games are being created in, in such a closed loop that it's really hard to see what's being built. And because it's not open, it makes me question, are they are they being built in, in a way that's going to be sustainable? Yeah. Uh, before we uh, before we cut out, I want to shout out to John uh, Keel from the chat. There's been a little back and forth here. So uh, I'll read these last two comments of his. Uh, but again, they already said, we're, this is going back to uh, Star Atlas for everybody mm -hmm. who has been following in the chat. Um, but again, they already said why they keep selling ships. For one, those ships are going to be part of the gameplay mechanisms. Two, they will buffer the overpricing to ease entry of new players. I'm not saying I completely disagree with you. I don't like it either. 
but there is an emission curve for Atlas, thus they can't increase rewards. And for Atlas price, it was meant to fall. It's the Star Atlas dollar. Now, um, I'll, I'll let the other guys comment here in a second, but my initial thing here, John Keel, uh, yes, the ships are going to be part of gameplay mechanisms in the future. However, um, the, the question is, is why do they need to be sold now? And that's what worries me because that that tells me that you're you're looking for more money coming into your ecosystem now, without having produced um, anything of a of a higher variety than just more different types of ships, right? Yeah. So the selling of NFTs without the actual groundwork for the use of those NFTs tells me that you're just it's almost like we were talking about earlier. You're just selling access. You're selling membership. You're not selling uh, ownership. OK, yep. if people aren't able to use these things to actually earn and you're just selling them, then basically you're kind of moving more towards the Ponzi than I, I want to see. What I want to yep. see is I want to see you moving more towards creating an actual game economy that people are going to be able to play and earn in. And right. if it takes you five years to do that, that's fine. But I need you to explain to me why you need more and more and more and more money yes. to do that. So, uh, so here's a couple considerations on that. One is when the whole idea of ships and why the ship reward couldn't be adjusted, there was a couple things that came up. And Wagner said that, one, we sold way more ships than we ever thought we were going to sell. Well, that's great news. The second thing is the people are staking far more ships than we thought they were going to stake. Okay, so you didn't have that built into your economic structure. So now this is something that's blindsided you, which means you no longer have the emissions to pay out as where you thought that that was your lever that you could adjust. So that's one. Then you want to sell new ships, which is going to put more pressure on the reward system. So why would you do that? And two, people who have heard that, well, we're going to keep selling ships because we want to continue to raise capital. Well, if you watch the interview that we did with Wagner, he said clearly that they have more assets than they can deploy right now. So if you have more assets than you can deploy, why wouldn't you be deploying these assets into marketing, which grows your community, which means you have more people to sell to for these new ships. But even in doing so, where are these emissions going to come from? If you already had taxed your emissions, if you're already at cap, new ship sales just puts more pressure on that. So these are the kind of questions, and I'm not saying they don't have legitimate answers. I'm just saying the answers given thus far just don't necessarily add up to me. And that doesn't mean I know what the hell I'm talking about. I'm just saying they don't make sense to me thus far. Yeah, and you're talking to people who, you know, I mean, you know, we're not bashing the pro uh, the project. I think people don't understand the, the difference between bashing something, fanboying something, or being critical. Right. We try to be critical about all the projects that we 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 talk about. So we want to look at the good. We want to look at the bad. We want to analyze: is it more good? Is it more bad? Where is it at? How's it doing right now? Now, I just mentioned that I bought more ships two weeks ago. So obviously, I'm not bashing the project, but obviously there are some some issues and it's good to talk about them because mm -hmm. we're the ones that keep these projects honest not us as in the metaverse nomads but us as in the community at large it's important as a community that we hold these projects accountable and not just fanboy them because if we just fanboy them they're gonna they're gonna run themselves right off a cliff let's look at all the corporations what do they do yep they they push 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 because they have to uh fund their own situation as far as their investors and whatnot. And they have to keep those guys happy. And that becomes the most important thing unless the fans hold them accountable. That's when they have to listen to the fans. And, and you know, it's, um, and, and it is, like you said, critical questions, because that's not saying what any, uh, what a project is doing is wrong. It's like, Hmm, this doesn't make sense to me. And I represent probably a lot of other folks in the community. So therefore help me understand where I'm confused here because this doesn't add up. That's kind of where I'm coming from with it. So, yeah. Yeah, Chris, uh, that's what I've been doing. I've been getting them at a discount later. It's been working out. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, at least you can do things with the ships. Uh, a lot of other assets that we might get involved with for other projects, you can't do anything. You're not airdropped anything. You can't stake anything. You can't earn anything. It's just you can only flip it. Yeah, it's actually kind of earned. Uh, it's kind of grown on me. It kind of seemed kind of weird at first, but 
checking on my ships every day has actually started to, I don't know, it's something I kind of enjoy for some weird reason. I guess just watch my little Atlas numbers go yeah. up and then I get to do my little, you know, swap to whatever else, you know. Yeah. I'm actually looking forward to the point in time where all of a sudden people can create some of those resources. And that's how you begin to start to seed the economy. So who knows? You might have the means to go and mine a, uh, you know, an asteroid or a meat, you know, something. And all of a sudden you have, can, you can start producing a fuel source or you're, you're someone that's creating toolkits or you're at the ammo factory. And now all of a sudden you have a marketplace for the things you're creating. So all of those things are exciting. And I love the project and I love what Star Atlas represents. I love the core team and all the things you're doing but these are still again critical questions that are appropriate to ask because i think it makes a, a project stronger when people are asking good questions so. agreed i'm right with you there gris so i got my little uni bombers they're they're adding up there buddy <laughs> we might be able to take something out here so we'll see all right so uh anybody wanted to wrap us up is it that time it is that time man two and a half hours in uh, always good, man. But we got a, a good handful of people st still here with us. And by the way, I know I keep saying this at the end of every episode, but I think at some point, maybe we'll do this before next week. I want to create like a third party poll because I want to hear from you guys and like the projects that you're into. Like, what is the stuff that's on your radar? Or even if it's just like, hey, you know what? Not too much. I show up and I watch this show here and this is what's on my radar. That's cool too. And so glad we can help with that. But for those of you that are also have your ear to the ground and doing stuff, I'd love to find out what you guys are into, what you think of the metaverse as a whole. Um, yeah. What projects excite you and all that good stuff. So with that, for me, that's all I've got to add. You guys got anything else? Any final closing thoughts? Thanks for watching, everyone. Yeah. yeah. So I just want to say we appreciate you guys coming on, sharing the content, uh, spending your time with us. You know, Just make sure and like and subscribe because it goes a long way. But also, outside of that, join, join the Rome Discord, uh, gorome.io, and you can take part in conversation there for whatever games we have um, that are listed. Um, and, uh, yeah, get, get, get into a community, uh, whether it's ours or someone else's, where you can – be exposed to more of this type of conversation it just it'll help you long term not financial advice good point there ray uh shout out to the rome discord i know personally i share there long before i share anything here so uh shout out to that and uh as far as where i'm at it's 12 40 uh, in california right now and uh i'm gonna say good morning because we're all so early to the metaverse we're all gonna make it if you're here indeed and uh, with that, uh, we're gonna get we're gonna go out again on one of our uh, Rome Guildies created uh, songs, Atlas Minor. And with all this song inspiration, I'm gonna have to get to get to work on uh, my own entry. And we'll see you guys uh, same time next week here Sundays as we are always. Peace out. Atlas Minor, you were born to push the block in search of all. Now it's time that you are gone So farewell, Atlas Minor And farewell mud and pony too Who's the sector same to you? The pirate bastards ran him through So farewell, Atlas Minor They promised you a diamond mine I'll be damned, it's hard to find I hope there's justice for their crimes And farewell, Atlas Minor And farewell, friend, don't take it hard Getting killed ain't all that bad I'll treat you well in the repair yard So farewell, Atlas Minor